can't read off the names. Uh, first thing we'll take up is agenda change requests and vote to approve the agenda. Um, I have one addition that I'd like to add is uh, the COVID, COVID attestation. In our emails, we received a notice to fill out a COVID attestation, this group. I don't know if we have to or not, but we'll add this to the agenda for discussion. Um, the other thing that we'd like to talk about is where to foot to insert Vicuda. Um, Will is here to present from Vicuda today. And we had talked about last meeting having him uh, do a presentation. I would propose we move it in just before the break, somewhere between 940 and 1040, if that's amenable. And what I'd like to do is the COVID attestation uh, just after the minutes. COVID here. Um, the other change to the agenda is approval of the minutes from 826. Holly has reviewed those, but sent those uh, pretty late last night around 11 p.m. And I haven't had a chance to review them, and I'm assuming nobody else has. So mm -hmm. we will take these off the agenda today for approval and just look at the September 9th meeting minutes. All right. Are there any other changes to the agenda, Laura? Uh, just a question about executive session items and whether or not those can be moved either to the front or the back, just for the folks that are on with us virtually, uh, if, if they can be. I'd prefer that we do that. Okay. Um, and then yeah, I'm happy to do that. We'll move those after public input. And then, Unless we have time for public input. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. If we can move those after public input. Yes. That's Unless we have time before, if we're like, we've completed all our business, then we'll take them up. Yeah. Because we so may or, go through. Or, 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 I'd like to hold the public input at noon or earlier if we have the capability to do so. So if we have some dead time in between public input, we'll, we'll do. Then we'll take up the executive okay. session. But yes, that's what I'm thinking. Is but so for anybody that's on the phone, public input will be at noon or slightly before if we get through all the business. So just you know, stay stay tuned on the on the video or however you're participating virtually. I have a um, 1215 hard stop. So okay, I do, I do too. I have to leave. Okay, <clears throat> we will get through this really quickly. The other item, Patty, is I just want to make sure that we talk briefly about where we are at with staffing. Okay. So, uh, you know, support for this team here is really important to understand where we're at. And I don't know where you'd like to put that. But Let's put that right after COVID. Okay. Thank you. Two, three. One, two, three. Okay, um, do I, any other discussion on the agenda changes? Motion to approve. Uh, second. Sorry. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, motion carries. All right, first end item on the agenda is approval of the minutes from September 9th, 2021. Any discussion? So we're going to not take up the 826 minutes because Holly just did an edit of those and sent those out at 11 o'clock last night. And I just haven't had time to review. I was sleeping. <laughs> so if there's no discussion changes, I'll take a motion to approve the September 9th, 21 minutes. So I have that one feedback point to this matter. I yes, it matters. Yeah, yeah, but make it formally. Know, and the minutes, because maybe the minutes reflect the discussion. I'm just trying to make the point that our vocabulary matters, and we got to get out of talking about multiple sources of baseline because we need because we've all agreed there's going to be one. So where are you on the agenda? I want to make sure it's change. In the minutes. In the minutes. The minutes. I'm sorry. Page minutes. two. Page two. And you want the you want the paginated too? I got that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so my feedback was, what was it? Yeah, it's right here, it's okay. printed out. And, and I don't know how we... Yeah, so when you make the motion to the minutes, make the motion with these amendments, and then you can approve them with the amendments and we'll make it's, the corrections. Yeah. Does it work to do that? Is it actually if the, translatable? If, yeah, well, if the minutes are accurate in the discussion, and I frankly don't recall it, but I'm only reacting to what I saw on the page, if the minutes are accurate of the discussion, then let's leave it. Mm -hmm. My point is simply going forward. 
it's not going to help us to have multiple references to multiple baselines when we've agreed we're going to have one baseline. Right. So I want to tighten up that vocabulary. <laughs> and I don't know if that needs to be, maybe that should be reflected in these minutes and not last minutes. I, I have a problem with how we're doing minutes because they are not reflecting consensus that's reached. Now we're stopping short of actually voting on some sort of decision, but there's consensus reached. And I did, I, I saw this on the uh, August 26 minutes as well. And then we talk more generally. And I, I think it's because we're asking somebody to both participate in the meeting and take the minutes. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I listened to the whole four hours and trying to, my only point is, I think this is such an important point that we might want to amend the minutes, like literally amend the minutes. Yeah, I don't care the mechanism yeah, as long as we. Yeah, and can. I should say, we, you know, one thing to do, and, and it's common with boards, is, you know, don't hesitate to make motions. Motions really do lock things in. So, you know, the, you make a formal motion, and that becomes very clear. For, you know, you talk about when you come to consensus. You can close that consensus. Yeah, let's, not get, let's not go down a rabbit hole. Exactly, so exactly. Point, I think my point is clear, right? So let's just do this if we can. Leave, I'm fine leaving the, the 9-9 minutes as they are, as long as the 9-16 minutes reflect the sentiment that referencing PSD data, VCBB data, and CUD data, we're going to work hard to just reference PSD as the baseline data, because that's the source of truth we've all agreed we're going to work off of. And, and again, if somebody doesn't agree with that point, I think we've I think we've all agreed to that point, and we're past that. Well, yeah, not, I, I, I'm not sure I agree. So let's fin let's finish the discussion. Well, yeah. it's what well, the board members agree. I, I know, but I'm just saying there may be. I want to provide you. I want to. I need some clarity on that because what we've been asked, what we plan on doing, is updating. Well, we, we, we're, we're going to be providing metrics, uh, measurable metrics yes. on a weekly basis. Off. That's not going to come from the department. No, no, I'm, I'm just talking about where, where are those metrics going to be derived from? What data source is that? Me are those metrics going to be derived from? It's the PSD. Yeah, we can't. We can't. They're not, they only update their database annually. So we're going to have to constantly be updating our own database. Yeah, but the baseline, you draw a line in the sand, you say, we start from here. Yeah. And that baseline data is from the PSD data set. That's right. Period. Annually changed. That's, right. that's, that's all it is. You are going to update that data going forward. And it's relative to the baseline set back here. So as you, as we make progress on things, database is updated and you measure the difference between here and here. And that's the right. baseline. And let me be, let me, let me be clear. I want to be clear before you update. They're not going to a separate database, right? They're right. going into the PSD exactly. baseline, right? Exactly. So no. Or not. So are we going to, are we talking? We're, this, we're hit, this, is this is a so problem. Cool. We have talked about this on 826, so 92, 99. And, and, and now apparently I didn't understand it's the okay, conversation. Okay, yeah, are, are you imagining that the VCBB will maintain a separate GIS database from what the PSD baseline is? Can I, and let me attempt this. Sure. Uh, so the PSD data is the baseline data updated yearly. As new projects are built, we are going to be tracking those. But the official broadband availability data is going to remain the public service department data. We need to track it as it goes for reporting purposes as things get built with each project. Right. So where will you be tracking those changes? In our own database. Yeah, the project, the projects that are approved and built will be in will be in a different database so we can have disclosure on what's happening in between those reporting periods. And when we say database, are we talking about a GIS data set? I yes. believe we're talking about a GIS data set and, and a map. So that so rather than having to wait till October of each year, you have an idea of what's been built and funded with public dollars during that previous year. Right. It'll all be great. Yeah. So It'll is there any reason those changes can't be simply performed by the VCBB GIS resource in the PSD GIS data set so that it's all in one place? Well, it's going to be using the same data set. I, I think the department 
I don't think the department's going to go for it. I think they wanted to keep doing their yearly updates since we're not going to have data that shows every single project happening in the state. We're only going to have data showing the publicly funded projects. So yeah, it's wanting, that's that was going to be my question. Do you so do you have this funny feeling like I do? I, do. <clears throat> I think it needs well. I don't understand why they wouldn't. It's merely a layer yes. and a data set. Yes. And uh, to create this somewhere else, I, I, I just don't understand why they wouldn't. And, well, we're and gonna be the using, statute requires the agencies of the state to cooperate with us. Well, we're going to be using the E911 data, and maybe that is the solution that we have a separate data. We have a separate layer showing what's been built in the last year, and then it is all aligned yes. afterwards. I think that's what I'm saying. And, I, I know Clay is on the call and uh, Corey might be. I'm confident they would have some feedback on our logistical questions. So could I make a suggestion? Rather than ruin our agenda with this discussion point, can we take this on in a subsequent meeting and nail it? Because it's, this is going to take a little bit of time. This is not a simple discussion. And the fact that we've gotten this far and we're not on the same page concerns me. I'm, I move that we adopt the minutes with the addendum of the um, Brian Otley September 15th email as an appendix. I'll second that. All right. I haven't called a vote yet. Hold on, I haven't called a vote yet. Okay. <laughs> and, and I actually have a comment, I'm sure. Hold on. So the proposal is to take Brian's email okay. as an appendix to the minutes. I'm not sure that makes sense to me. A different email. This one that says feedback on the minutes from the sure. last meeting. Can we begin numbering pages? Mm -hmm. Number two, the first full paragraph of page two regarding baseline data. The way this is written, it talks about PSD data, VCDB data, and CUD data. This is not accurate. There is PSD data, and that is the data we've all agreed will be used, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, I got it. I, I just, I'm not, I think this is a future item to discuss. I'm not sure it makes sense to correct the minutes because I think we did talk about, I, we did go back and forth at the September 9th meeting. I don't, I think it's a, an item for us to discuss so we can get all on the same page. I think the, what we talked about at the last meeting, we, it sounds like Christine had one interpretation, Brian had another. I'm not certain that the minutes are incorrect based on this discussion that just happened. So rather than addendum to the, the states, we didn't talk about it. I think that we did talk about what's in the minutes, but I think we do need to put this on for a future agenda item to clarify. I think you're right. I'm my second. Fine. I would have drawn one to. Okay. I still have my comment. Okay. Go ahead. So, uh, you know, if we have, if we are maintaining a data pool, a data set, and the department is maintaining a data set, the department is going to be changing theirs, right? Just to be clear, with private uh, builds from private providers. And we would be changing. Yeah, and, and we would be changing with CUD, and that does not make sense. I mean, we I think the layer aspect. You think it's all going to be at one place? I think so. Yeah. yeah. Yes, I, I, I think so. Yeah. But we but also. We're I also but we're going to have this discussion. We have, we have our own yeah, that's fine. Yeah. yeah. But let's have this discussion as a separate agenda item, and maybe sure. can we look at the data so we can get a better handle on that? Can we pull up the data. Let me pull up the data. The new data, I believe, is going to be released in October. Uh, and as I said, I know we have we have Corey and Clay participating. They might be able to provide. Yeah, I, I just I don't want to get into this right now as okay. an agenda item, but we're going to put it on for a future meeting okay. to discuss in more detail. So then the folks at the DPS can be ready to talk about it, and it may help to put the data up so we can actually see what we're talking about. But we'll definitely yeah. future agenda. I have it listed as first item for future agendas. Okay, with that, do we have a motion to approve the minutes as written? Moved. Okay. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Minutes are passed. Um, first, uh, next item on our agenda is the addition of the COVID attestation. We received an email, at least I received an email, asking for us to all sign something. 
I tried to click on the links, nothing happened. Um, so I would like to just tee this up as a discussion item to see, I'll put it on Christine, your list to see, do we have to fill that out? You do not have to fill that out. The reason okay. you got that is because that was distributed to a state email system and you're an exception. Okay. Thank you. That's easy. No. Um, the next item on the agenda is a staffing update. And I'll turn that over to Christine. Um, we are the the uh, jobs are being posted next week. Um, it's uh, a, the the state system is a little complex, so Carol had to do a lot of work. If you if you if you post a different job position than ones in the existing database, it takes about a month to get approved. So Carol had to spend some time trying to figure out how to fit the jobs we're looking for into existing classifications. So Carol. Carol is the human resource support from the Public Service Department. So if you look at uh, timeline, uh, we're, there's a requirement for the administrative assistant to be posted for 14 days before you can hire. So it'll be a, probably a month before we get our administrative assistant. The others we can start hiring as soon as it gets, we can start interviewing as soon as it gets posted. Mm -hmm. So those postings will go up next week. Uh, so, Madam Chair, yes. um, I have concerns about the workload that is on uh, these folks, the expectation, our needs of these folks, the CUD's needs. And so, you know, I'm looking for some alternative strategies. Um, you know, are there things that, you know, I noted there was some discussion about work groups outside and um, we had reserved a day for doing work. I think it was the 28th or something. Um, I would really like to hear from you all, um, you know, ways that we could, you know, I, I can give a few more hours, you know, on that day or, you know, how can we offload some work to make sure that we're doing the detail that is necessary and also, you know, continuing to move the ball forward and not cooking you guys, you know, so. I don't know how to deal with I don't know how to deal with it, but I'm really concerned about this actually. Christine, do you have an update from just your perspective right now with you and Rob, how it's going? We're we've been scrambling um for search. Sure. You know, I keep uh, coaching Bob, but Rob because he has family and it's you know, so I know it's been stressful for you, Rob. Um I think the fact that we're moving the meetings to every two weeks will help a lot because we spend a lot of time you know, or I, you know, we, the two of us. Um, yeah, we're scrambling, but I do appreciate your suggestion and we do, could use some help. Um, and we, I'll work with Rob to come up with a list. Um, and, and also the, the state systems are much more cumbersome than I've ever dreamed of. You know, this morning I finally got this, you know, for, for example, getting a GIS resource, you have to go through the Agency of Digital Services and they have this very complex statement of work RFP that I just ran into a roadblock that I just found out this morning I didn't need to fill it out. So I've got help on that now, but it just takes, you know, the systems are pretty, they're a lot more complicated than in the private sector. In terms of working groups of things that would take some, take a, a little bit of the pressure off of us and help move things along faster is we are starting to receive pre-construction grant applications. I, I would, would love to have a board member involved in the scoring, both for both for best practice and accountability, and also just for someone else to take an eye on that since we're we're doing so much at the moment. That would be, be one suggestion. Uh, another suggestion would be is we may be able to, I think I mentioned this at the previous meeting, when this goes back to actually minute taking. There's a service that'll do the minute taking, that'll do a video and provide all those things. That would take some administrative burden off of us. And I believe it, this is the state, so who knows? I, it could be um, within the micro-purchasing uh, threshold, and I don't know if it would have to go through ADS, but that would be something I would I think we can love to see. Service in. very recently, like for a month, even. Are we able to make a motion to to authorize that or no? So yeah. it, yeah, I'm with yeah, you. Yeah, but yeah. if it's going to take a month to get a month service, no, 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 we should, no. I think that's a, Rob and I were talking about this. All right, this let's. Exactly, we need that right away. Friendly motion to pursue it and yeah. explore it if it makes sense. So what are we, are we talking about like, because what, what, as soon as you said that, what popped in my head is 
get just get a court steno that like the PUC uses who can just transcribe the meeting. I, I think that that would, given that it would be a, a, a state position, meeting. it's a, that's a whole other can of worms yeah, to try to contract. do. Oh, yeah. short the thing, since since I have been on the EC Fiber Board and they do use that service mm -hmm. you're talking about, the thing that makes that work is somebody sits down and goes through it, though. Absolutely. I mean, yeah. yeah. Okay. Because they're they're transcribing something they yeah. they're just it's just all words. You to them. Clean it up, right? Yeah. <laughs> So there's still workload. Yeah. So, um, so, so would you like a motion? Yes. Okay. So uh, I move that we authorize staff to move to explore and, if possible, move forward with securing minute taking service and transcription and service. general admin support and and general admin support. I'll second that. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed. Thank you. So going back to the, the working group side of things, uh, is there, we can talk offline or someone can volunteer right now, is there <clears throat> anybody who's willing to, willing and able uh, to help with doing the, the basic scoring of the applications? The board itself will have to vote to approve the applications, but someone that's going in a bit, a bit deeper and a bit earlier. How much time do you think that would chew up? Yeah, how many have you gotten in so far? We're, we're, we've only had one so far. I expect another possibly up to three by next Tuesday. How long does it take you to get through one score itself, just based on the one? I, I haven't scored it yet. Okay. Yeah, and, I, and I haven't scored it yet. Before you answer that, I want to throw in another request too. So. Yeah, and we're, when we're asking for, we've asked for a lot of information and I want to make sure that we read it and absorb yeah. it. Exactly. And I, I encourage the, I encourage you all to read the applications yeah. regardless of whether yeah. you're doing the working group or not. Uh, but, <laughs> but should, should it be the same eye that is scoring all of them as opposed to, to right yeah. and, and if that's the case then I think I, I would not offer because my husband is a member of a CD. Yeah and before you that's before you make a decision on this one because I really want I'm kind of looking at you and you and Brian for specific help on on developing the uh, design guidelines. We had the meeting yesterday, I'll update you on that, but certainly I'm looking for some expertise in helping those, with those design guidelines. Um, I'll go through and score. I can be a scorer. Okay. I, I mean, I, I have big questions about the scoring format, but it's just yeah, out of like, really, does this work? But, um, yeah, so, well, so, I, I saw so we Holly, trained, so they were yeah. consistent. Yeah, and I Holly, guess. I would encourage you to take it as a, a board role assignment versus going into the weeds of evaluating I'm this. Not gonna I, I just make any comments uh, outside this room that changes or addresses process. Okay, because that way you're 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 following what is the yes. matrix and the rules of what already been set up. Yes. So rather than go in and say, oh, let's I'm change clear. that, or yes, you got it. Okay. Happy to have you take that. I role. know I have Thank editor you. itis. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you for doing that. Thank my husband. Another, <laughs> have, have, have another set of eyes on these, and, and we'll, we'll talk more about this when we get to the grant scoring question. But yeah, maybe after the uh, after I do the uh, output on the uh, the uh, design workshop yesterday. You'll understand more about what my request is. Yeah, uh, Christine, I would volunteer to help in that. Oh, that'd be great. Yeah. So I you, Dan, you're the, also going to do the scoring too? No, this is a different request. Uh, engineering. Design. Engineering. Sorry. Engineering design support. I think that's the right band to be best yeah, position yeah. for that. I agree. Okay. And, and I would ask that we remember with design that it is not a statewide fiber design that we are obligated to do, but, you know, we are not obligated to do, required to do that. Yeah, but we are trying to make it an interconnected yeah. system. Uh, yes, yeah. which we have now with so all of our different telecommunications providers. So I think best practice is to do something that would be yes. 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 yes, yes, yes. Thank you, Dan. Okay. Thank you, Dan. Is there anything else on staffing to discuss? Point. Hearing nothing, we are going to move to the next agenda item, which is RDOF discussion with Clay Purvis and Corey Chase. Turn it over to you to team up. Sure. I, actually, um, I'll I'll just turn it right over to uh, Clay and Corey.
Great, thank you for having us. Uh, my name is Clay Purvis. I'm the director for telecommunications and connectivity uh, with the Department of Public Service. And uh, with me is uh, Corey Chase. Uh, you all asked Corey to give a little uh, update or presentation on RDOF. Um, we uh, have prepared a, uh, a, a small presentation and um, I'm hoping that we can keep this somewhat informal and, and just have a nice discussion about uh, RDOF. Um, and hopefully we can answer any questions you have. So with that, I'll turn it over to Corey. Hello, everyone. Um, so I think I can present. I'm not sure. Is that working? Can you see the presentation? Yes. Yes. So I'll, I'll try to be brief and um, we can talk if you have more have questions. Um, so the the RDOF is the uh, Rural Digital Opportunities Fund. Um, it's a program of the FCC. Um, so I think it's important to start with a little bit of history about what the FCC has done with universal service. So um, for context, this, this map shows um, the incumbent local exchange carrier territories. Um, these are not town boundaries, these are wire center boundaries. Um, all of the, tele, the way the telephone companies built their networks, all locations in a wire center boundary are served by a single central office. And um, these, these wire centers are operated by different companies, but there's two main distinctions. You have the, um, the RBOC, the Regional Bell Operating Company, which in Vermont, the legacy RBOC is consolidated to CCI. They have approximately 84% of the locations in the state. And then you have the RLEX, the Rural Local Exchange Carriers, and they have approximately 16% of the locations in the state. So in this map, um, light green is the consolidated territory and blue is the various um, RLEC territories. So the RLECs include- Your screen isn't showing right now. I'm not sure, I'm not sure why, because I'm seeing it on my screen here, but it's not showing in Giga. Uh, it was. <laughs> And it was. I clicked, some, I clicked something that said exit spotlight. I thought that was taking my video out of the. the um, well, I'll, I'll kick you out of spotlight, Clay. Actually, you already did. But Corey yeah. is spotlighted and should should be able to share his screen right now. And yeah, was, I, I can sure. see it on my end. So you can. <clears throat> yeah, that's strange. Maybe it is something on our side in the room, which is there. It is. Is. There it is. I don't know. <laughs> So, Rob, just for the for for a few minutes, could you um, mute your your microphone? Certainly. Not not your microphone, the um the the Giga microphone. Does that okay? Come back, unmute, and, and let me know if you if you stop seeing the the screen. Um, and I'll be brief, and then we can come back for questions. Um. So it, the, the I was. I was I was saying that the territory in Vermont, um, it, it, the most of the territory is the, the regional Bell Operating Company legacy com uh, territory, which is consolidated, and the blue shows the, uh, the, the rural local exchange carriers. That includes uh, VTEL, Waitsfield, Franklin, Shoreham, and TDS. So, Brief history of the Federal Universal Service Fund. Um, the, the, federal, uh, the Federal Universal Service Fund was created to ensure that, there, that, ev that the telephone companies could provide telephone service to everyone with the understanding that it's more expensive to provide service in rural areas than in urban areas. And so um, they were given money, uh, the, the federal, federal, the FCC provided a system to give funds to um, the, the, the incumbent telephone companies to support service in rural areas. Um, there are different approaches for the RBOC, the Regional Bell Operating Company in Vermont Consolidated, and the RLEX. And um, it's that's beyond the scope of with this discussion, but it's important to note that there are different approaches that the FCC has employed to, to provide that support. 
a significant change happened with the transformation order um, and the Connect America Fund. So the Connect America Fund had two phases. The first phase was to give uh, to, to kind of shift the way that they had been doing funding to support only voice service and change to supporting voice and broadband. That, as an aside, was a very complicated thing to do because the, the federal language supporting the idea of using universal service fund, were, it was directed for telecommunications service. And the, the, the idea of using um, money for telecommunications services to support broadband was a little bit complicated because broadband, as you know, is not a telecommunications service or many claim that it's an information service. Um, and that is a different category of service. At any rate, um, the Connect America Fund uh, provided uh, $8 million a year to consolidate it over six years, and they were required to deploy service. Um, they were required to com continue to offer universal voice service to all their locations, and they were required to de deploy. I'm getting a lot of feedback. Um, they were required to deploy uh, for uh, DSL service to a specific quantity of locations. Um, the the new phase that we're talking about now of Federal Universal Service Fund um, is a, a, the the next iteration after the the Connect America Fund. This new this new phase of federal funds federal approach is the Rural Digital Opportunity Fund (RDOF). So RDOF Phase One was for one set of areas essentially completely unserved areas. And RDOF phase two will be coming eventually to serve other other parts of the, connect, the, the consolidated territory. So going back to what I mentioned before, CAF phase one was part of the transformation order about eight years ago. Um, this was the territory that the, um, the FCC was worried about. And to identify this territory, the FCC took the entirety of consolidated territory. So I'm going to flip back for a second to show you that again. Uh, so all of this green territory is consolidated. From all of this green territory, they selected the areas that are in the blue here um, for their Connect America Fund program. The Connect America Fund program, they used a very complicated cost model that figured out what they um, what it would probably cost companies to deploy service. Um, and they picked a window and said, if it was above above a certain cost, then it was needed, needed support. But if it was too expensive, they didn't want to include that either. So through the, the mechanisms of this cost model, they determined that they would give consolidated support for 29 or 28,399 locations. The difficulty is that there were actually 45,000 locations in these blue territories. So Consolidated met its requirements and it provided DSL service to the required 28,399 locations. So for the RDOF, the next phase, um, it's important to note that uh, what the RDOF did is it said, we, uh, the FCC for the RDOF, it said, we are going to select census blocks. These, these, these blue marks here in the Connect America Fund are similar, they're census blocks. Um, but they're clipped to the RDOF territory, so it's not the entirety of a census block. So that that gets complicated. And it also said that we're only going to fund those census blocks where no provider said that they've got availability of 25-3 service. And then from those unserved census blocks, again, we're only going to select those census blocks where we think the cost is within the um, the 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 perfect cost window, not to uh, more than more than we expect the companies could um, deploy and earn earn back their investment, but not be um, but lower than the maximum cost we think that is too exorbitant for the pro program to support. Then they did a reverse auction and they said um, we're going to select. I'm getting a lot of feedback from someone here. Um, we're going to provide we're going to select the company that offers service to these census blocks at the lowest cost and then the fcc requires deployment to these areas to all locations in these census blocks within six years so this is the for vermont um, there were five bidders 
and um, the the five the five winning bidders, um, and they are scheduled to receive a a total of three million dollars a year each year over the next ten years. And they're required to serve um, areas that the FCC thinks have 19,330 locations. It's important to note that um, EC Fiber and Kingdom Fiber are both members of the NRTC consortium. So in, in actuality, the, the number of uh, the FCC model um, that, that estimated the quantity of locations in these territories, it wasn't, it isn't, it, super accurate because it's based on household uh, census census household information but it's also not completely incorrect um, so there's a the the good news i guess is that there is a a, a a greater quantity that they are expected to serve than are actually there which suggests that the fcc's approach of holding them to require service to all locations in the territories is a, a reasonable approach um, by that, I mean that the, FC, the, the companies should expect to serve every location within their, their census blocks. This map um, is on our website, and it's available on our website in a moving map, um, in an interactive map, in addition to it, this, this PDF map. It's hard to see all the individual census blocks on a, on a PDF, but this shows you the extent of the territory. So much of the, the Northeast Kingdom um, is is covered in the two different companies, um, Kingdom Fiber and Consolidated. Consolidated, you see, has service in places all around the state. Um, uh, EC Fiber has some uh, quite a number of of, of territories. Um, it, it, SpaceX was awarded locations in very strange hodgepodge things. Most of their the the places that SpaceX was awarded are tiny little segments many of which actually don't have any buildings in them. Um, it's, a, it's an interesting dynamic, the way that the FCC, the way that they did their, it's, a, it's an art, what, what, what the FCC might call a data artifact. It's a result of clipping census blocks. Um, if, you, if you assume a census block has 100 households and then you clip a segment of it, you don't really know for sure if the clipped segment has a building in it. Um, and that ended up with the, the, many of the census blocks have that. Uh, many of the SpaceX census blocks have that problem. Corey, if I could just interject there, it, it's worth noting that the Rosenworcel uh, Commission is um, looking into um, some of the census blocks that uh, were awarded through RDOF. It, it was her opinion that um, so, some of these awards were made in haste and that they include areas that are not deserving of USF support. So the the blocks might change uh, or, or the information might change uh, in, the, in the coming weeks and months. Yes, yeah, I agree. And that would be good, especially for census for, for SpaceX. Um, so um, for deployment, the RDOF uh, requires, it's a, this is important to note that the RDOF, the FCC RDOF requires the companies to offer both voice service and broadband service independently as separate standalone things. So if you live in an RDOF census block, the company is required to offer a standalone telephone service by itself, just telephone service. And it's also required to offer standalone, just broadband service if you want it or of course a bundle. Um, and then for deployment, um, they've got this uh, rolling schedule so that it's required 100% uh, deployment within six years, but also 40% um, after the end of the uh, third calendar year after funding and 20% again after, after each year after that. And then uh, for compliance, the FCC requires that the bidders submit a, um, a letter of credit, and the purpose of this letter of credit is to allow recovery of past support disbursements um, from a company that might may eventually default. And the company, all, the FCC also includes a non-compliance framework um, that calls for uh, greater reporting and um, a, a withholding of, of support if the company fails, if the, if the grant recipient fails to comply. So that, that covers my presentation. Um,
And if you have, have questions, I can answer some quick questions. Thanks, Corey. I have a question. Uh, so um, <clears throat> with the compliance, uh, how are, um, who's, who is certifying that those addresses are served? Are the companies, is it self-certification? Uh, so, so I want to just make one thing clear here. This is um, the the FCC, FCC telecommunications programs generally, and FCC t programs are very complicated. Um, and we we at the part department um, have a lot of experience in telecommunications issues, and we try to follow these issues. But we're also very busy doing lots of other things, and so. Um, I, I don't know the, the, the arcania of this as, as, as things are changing quickly in this complicated uh, field. But in general, the, what I would say is that the companies are required to report to the FCC that they have complied with the requirement. And the FCC it, will follow up with them if they think that that's um, unreasonable. So, so the answer, the answer to your question... Yeah. The answer to your question is this is self-reporting. The company itself needs to report to the FCC that, yes, we have complied with the requirement. And usually that, that is through a process of lit, providing a list of addresses. Okay. So, for instance, and the way that the FCC does this is it's actually outsourced the, um, the implementation of these grant programs to a, 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 a company, a um, quasi-company called the, the USAC, the Universal Service Administration Co Corporation. So it, the companies, FCC, uh, the, it, like say for instance, um, EC Fiber, EC Fiber will be required to provide a list of addresses that his, it has provided service to. It, it must provide that list of addresses uh, to USAC through its um, hub portal. Um, and then if it provides the correct number of addresses, then USAC will report to the FCC, yes, um, the company has complied with its obligations. Um, just to be clear, when we say reporting addresses served, it's addresses passed, right? It's not addresses to which there's been connection to this to the network. So all of this discussion is about the availability of service, not any discussion about the adoption of service. Mm -hmm. So then, yes. Right. Corey, can you go over the RDOF timeline? And the reason I asked this question is RDOF has certain uh, time markers that folks that participated in one in the auction that they have to meet. And we also have timeline markers. And I'm just curious the overlap. Did you hear the question? Yes. Yes. Um, so the RDOF deployment obligations are such that um, this, are you seeing my screen? Yes. So it says we will require support recipients to commercially offer voice and broadband service to 40% of the calculated number of locations in the state by the end of the third full calendar year following funding th authorization. Thank you, that's helpful. And, and that timing is as reflected in your chart then? I believe so. Barry, can you talk We're briefly about what happens if uh, RDOP winner defaults, if they can't fulfill their commitment, or if, they, if they're sold, if they go out of business? Like, what, what, what are the contingencies? Not <laughs> really they choose not to, I guess is the... <laughs> Rob, if, if they go out of business, there's nothing the FCC can do. Well, um, so, uh, Clay, I think um, yeah. the important thing here is, are, are you still seeing my screen? Yes. yes. So the FCC requires a part of the part of the process. The FCC requires a letter of credit um, to allow recovery of disbursement. So past disbursements. Past, past disbursements. Well, what happens to those locations? So if Some the if the company, um, it, I, I'm not quite sure I follow your question, Rob. Can you try your question again? That it would be sold. I guess there's a presumption that it would be sold. Okay. I, I, I guess what is, I'm saying is if is a company there, has a commitment to build them and then they no longer can meet that commitment, are those addresses served by someone else? Are they thrown back into the next phase of RDOF? 
what happens to that support that was pledged to those locations? Um, so I think uh, there there are many different questions that you've that you've posed in one there. Um, I think that if a if a company um, first of all if a company has a, a a grant from the FCC that's not something that anybody should or would take lightly lightly and um, the FCC does a very deep um, due diligence process in its long form evaluation and it requires this letter of credit and it's got there's a there's a an assumption that the company is is going to provide the service to these locations and and it's not something that anybody takes lightly so uh let me ask the let me ask this question so in the past rob there have been federal awards for service delivery to um a number of addresses that have not happened and so if that were to happen in this case if a company was awarded funds to to provide service to addresses and they didn't take the funding and didn't provide the service what would are there any repercussions for that company so are you that, asking about repercussions laura or are you asking about what happens to the addresses yeah well, well that's what we're concerned about is how to think about the art off addresses that's really what we're concerned about like should we say check those are done or well we got to keep an eye on those and which is certainly where i am I don't think and I, well, I, I don't think, think I think it's always good to keep an eye on on this program and uh, be sure that the promises that were made are being kept. Um, I, I think a kind of more salient question is at what point do you decide to provide um, a state uh, subsidy to the same locations because certainly you don't want to double fund a um an area that already has a federal solution in place with that said i will remark that when we were uh completing the telecommunications plan uh, earlier this summer we did have ardoff winners who uh, advocated for the state providing additional subsidy to the ardoff winning areas which to us i think raises an alarm as to um whether the promises made are realistic. Um, I would, I think it was our position in writing the telecom plan that if there's a funded federal solution in place uh, for these areas that um, we may not want to make that the, the primary focus of state funding. There is a second phase to ARDOF, Laura. So uh, it was my understanding when the ARDOF order came out that uh, addresses that were not covered in phase one would also be that were supposed to be covered in phase one, but ultimately not covered would be covered in phase two. Um, New addresses, there, like additional addresses. There are two phases to ARDOF. So I this phase part, yeah. is just for um, census blocks that are considered completely unserved or not contaminated, and then phase two after they complete the, the DODC um, proceeding to figure out a better way to do mapping, they will move to phase two, which will be the contaminated census blocks. I believe, I'm not 100% certain, but I do believe that addresses that for whatever reason were not covered in phase one will be re rebid in phase two. Corey, maybe you know differently, I don't know. I believe that that is the intent that if if for whatever reason a, there is a problem with the the deployment or compliance with phase one that the FCC that the money is available and the money is committed for those census blocks and they would they would pursue trying to get the company to to continue to deploy it and if for the company just balked and said that we're we're bankrupt. Um, then those those census blocks and those funding would be available. And as Clay suggested, I, I believe that they would be rolled into the next um, auction, the phase two auction. So the addresses are set. It's and so phase two would just look, did the address get served? If not, we're going to rebid the same address. Phase I, I two is not so. new addresses. 
Avengers. No, Phase Two well, will be. Um, they, they, or you might might be aware of this, but the FCC is in the process of changing the way that it does broadband um, availability data gathering. It's frust. Everybody is frustrated with the way that the FCC collects broadband data, and um, they're in the process of changing their that that mechanism. And they don't want to do the RDOF phase two to go after the very messy problem of partially served census blocks until they get the data fixed. And so their their process right now is to fix the data collection process to get their data at the same sort of discussion that you folks are having about getting a baseline. They want to get the data right. And then they're going to proceed to the auction for the un, unserved locations in those partially served census blocks. So I have a different question. Are you okay? Uh, yeah, I would just say that that begs the question of, you know, like how will the CUD's planning areas be treated in that with FCC? Well, yeah, I, I think the question is to what degree this RDOF is an overlay for our work, right? And so one of the questions I have, and I apologize, I don't know if this goes to Claire or Corey. Hi, guys. Um, what is the level of funding? that's part of this program and is it, does it um, bet out in a per mile and a dollars per mile or dollars per address format? Corey, you wanna take a initial yeah. stab at that? So um, this is, it, it was a bid process, Holly. It was a, um, they, yeah. they, the FCC made these uh, census blocks available and called for bids for the lowest bidder to provide service. Um, so this is what the bids showed. Um, companies bid on these locations and here's the the amount of support. This is annual support over 10 years. Um, so it's $30 million for approximately 20,000 locations. Yeah, I mean, you actually have the David Healy's email addresses that specifically to CD Fiber. Nationwide, it, it worked out to about 15% of the total cost per address. You don't know what that was in Vermont? It, it's well, like we're a about 10% off coupon is what we called it. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, and, and you should right. also know that I've read just an article just the other day that many of the, there's a lot of defaulting going on right now because, it, because they, you know, they're, it, either, either the applicants were overzealous or what I'm hearing from the applicant that I spoke to in Vermont is, well, they expected to get more money. So somewhere between there is. Well, they bid. Exactly. How can they expect to get more money? I don't know what the yeah, that's Hope, hope springs eternal, doesn't it? Yes. Um, it does. Corey, the, Corey, do I have this right? They they did by block. They didn't bid for a number of locations unless they did the math to try to translate blocks into locations, right? They did, they were bidding on blocks. They were bidding on census block groups. And the census, no, no, the bidding was unblocked, right? The bidding was unblocked. The awards were on groups, but the bidding was unblocked. And um, the 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 model spit out the quantity of locations in the census blocks. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Keep, keep just, in mind. Just, just for the just for the recording or the conversation, Dan and I have both done the math, and that equals out to one hundred and sixty-eight dollars and thirty cents per location. <laughs> That's every year. That's over each that, year. That's, yeah. per, that's per year. Okay, big deal. 1683. Okay, but, but keep, keep in mind, uh, Holly, um, I, I think your question is very good. Um, the, the, the level of support needed depends, I think, on the company. And for consolidated communications, this is uh, a support mechanism that it and its, pre its predecessors have relied on for over 30 years now. Or more. Um, this is a uh, an amount of support that um, they have come accustomed to. Um, they have used previous awards under CAF to further push out their fiber. So, for instance, Consolidated has you know fiber to their remote terminals. They are much closer to that last mile uh, than perhaps some other bidders were. Um, so, I mean, it's it's really a matter of what what the solution is that's being funded um, with with that said there is you know a national concern that I think Christine just highlighted um, there is an organization out there called Eric 
uh, as mostly, I think, made up of telephone companies who believed that they were substantially underbid or they were, um, you know, outbid by companies who are um, uh, very much lowballing it. So it, it's not it's not a perfect situation, but um, both the uh, the R box and, and there's a separate program that we haven't talked about for rural Lex. They also get high cost support. Uh, it's, it's a totally different issue, um, but this is uh, an amount of money that they've been relying on for many, many years um, and have kind of built it into their um, um, and into their cost models. Thank you. Corey, can I ask, um, I think I know this to be true, but please confirm for me, the mapping you've done already based on the RDOF results, you've got, you've captured the data to the degree it can be accurate in the PSD data, right? That's, you guys have that layer and you know, census blocks and at least the locations presumed to be in those census blocks by the awardee and, and we have at least have our best pass at that data already so so to to be uh this this could easily turn into a different discussion but um I, I'll, uh, um so th this this was posed as as a discussion about ardoff so uh, we have the information about the RDOF territory and the information about the quantity of locations in those in those territories, and that's published uh, on our website. Um, broadband deployment data that we have published in the past and that we are working on updating now is a, is only information from the service providers saying where they have service. So we've asked the companies to say where they offer service today. And that's what is in the, the the broadband deployment data, and that's what we are updating right now, and will update soon. The RDOF has nothing to do with that. Um, right. And in the past, when the department has done programs, we have considered, for instance, where broadband deployment is available, and then we considered things like um, ongoing things in process, like the RDOF or um, connectivity initiative state grants or other grants that we are aware of, or um, CUD programs or pro programs that people are contemplating. And then we subtracted those locations on a location basis to make uh, areas eligible. So um, to answer your question, Brian, we are working on updating the broadband deployment data. That'll be static information about what is present today with no analysis given to other projects in process. You, uh, you, would, you would be, it, it would be our experience that you would probably retain an expert and do that calculation yourself to consider which locations you might want to um, add or subtract um, from your eligibility requirements. Got it, thanks. Is it fair to expect, Corey, and, and you know, this was built as an RDOF conversation, but it was built as an RDOF conversation because we needed to understand the data. So uh, it, they are closely related. So is it re reasonable to, uh, to expect that as you're building layers of um, programs that are impacting locations, mm -hmm. that you would accept a layer from the VCBB of, of locations funded or planned? So uh, the statute directs us to work with service providers and we we talk to service providers and ask them to tell us where they have service available. So for instance, EC Fiber um, provides information about where they have service available. We would expect if AFA-CUD becomes active and starts providing service, we would ask them for service. So we would ask them for information about where they have service, and we would include that in our broadband um, statistics. Um, I don't think that we would ask companies about where they are going to have service. Um, okay. And I don't I think, think that we would I, ask. I the think DCBB. probably that would be a separate. That would be a separate data set or a separate map. Um, I was just thinking it could be an overlay. Or I think we thought it might be an overlay. I think it definitely could be an overlay, but I would expect that that would be something that you would do. Corey, when we do our broadband availability solicitation, 
Um, are we, do we ask them where you will have service in the next six months or is it the six months prior? I think it said as of um, 1231, 20. 20, okay. I, I thought in the past we had done it kind of forward looking, um, but I can see reasons why we wouldn't continue to do that. So the new data set that's coming out uh, October-ish uh, will not include anything that's been built in 2021. Correct. In some cases, it does. I mean, I've been working very diligently with all the providers to try to get their data as accurate as possible. Um, but, you know, the, the biggest data sets come from the cable companies and they're a product of their um, annual analysis, which comes at the end of the year. So, like, for instance, we know Consolidated has built a lot of fiber this year. Is that that's not going to be included in the maps, or is it? I, mean, I guess I'm trying to get whether it varies from uh, from company to company, or it whether varies it really from company is to a, company. Okay, so it's not a 1231, 2019, 2020 cutoff. It's a very. Um, I, I I must say that it's a painstaking, difficult process because you have two choices. You can be rigorous and say um, this is the way that you must send us all data and make it up to them to send you data and then you could easily incorporate that um, but you'll get very limited compliance basically over to everybody will ignore you because it's a voluntary process um, the alternative is to be super flexible and take things written on the back of a napkin and try to make sense of it um, and get better data but that takes a lot of work um, and so we're we're trying to do the best we can. Uh, you 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 all are doing great, and I think we all recognize that we have the best data in the country. Uh, it still is some of it from the back of a napkin, but it's <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it is really good data, and we appreciate all that work. And keep in mind, you asked about consolidated, and certainly we do publish a map of a hundred a hundred. But for your charge, you know, I, my understanding is that the addresses that the VCBB and the CUDs are focused on with public funding, at least to start, are those that don't have 25.3. And consolidated fiber builds are, are a, an overbuild of um, cable video service by and large. So we don't expect that CCI's um, fiber construction is actually going to advance the, the 25.3 uh, bucket that far, if at all. Um, it will it will advance the 100 100 bucket but um we don't see it as a bill that's going to get unserved and underserved people fiber service this year right it's more of if they're building out to ardoff addresses that they, they may right when they start the ardoff when that starts then i think you'll see cci fiber making an impact on unserved locations one one thing that I, I did want to mention that Clay that you re reminded me talking about CCI fiber, um, as as you're contemplating the idea of whether you want to provide grant funding to locations that are um, subject to RDOF grants, um, a couple of things that you might want to think about are that um, you know if if you're over if you're if a company is going to over if you're going to give a grant fund to a company that's going to overbuild an RDOF territory, that really leaves two, uh, one of two options. Um, the, the new entity either is going to partner with that RDOF recipient, right? They're going to partner with them somehow, which means giving the RDOF recipient more money to do something that it has already agreed to do in a public process. So that's one option. The other option is you're going to compete with that, that, that the company that you're supporting is going to compete with that company. So that means that that um, that will be essentially uh, undermining the business model of both entities because the the new entity that you're giving a grant funding to is going to have a com um, a, a competitor that has public subsidy, and the company that the FCC is giving money to has a public subsidy that's going to be competing against your company. Those are those are really the only two options that you have if you're going to give money to a company that is already a grant recipient. Um, 
Another thing that you might want to consider, I don't have an opinion on this, but you might want to consider whether ARPA funding can be used to build something that's already subject to a grant. I, I don't know, I have an answer on that. Yeah, I'll just I'll just chime in. The folks that bid in RDOF were bidding in in a time frame when fiber costs were a whole lot lower. So their business model needs to have additional pancake grants to make it work. So even though they're getting potential grant dollars from RDOF, or not getting, they are getting grant dollars from RDOF, the business case has changed so dramatically because the cost of equipment is through the roof. So I think they do need to pancake and layer on in order to make RDOF come to fruition. That's one good reason. Another good reason for collaboration with an RDOF recipient is that you then have a local view on mm -hmm. how that deployment is happening and the support of that community union district in ensuring the delivery. Mm -hmm. And I just think that that's worth paying something more for anyway, personally. Mm -hmm. this, I, I, I absolutely think it's something that we, we're going to need to figure out. But the, I think the question is whether or not these funds, the ARPA funds, are eligible to be yeah, used yeah, there. Yeah. That's top the of question. RDOF. Yeah. Yes, Let, right. Can we, if, can we pancake and layer up? Which is does not good. mean, I mean, so if the answer is no, then, I mean, I think when we're putting together models, because we're clear that ARPA dollars are probably not going to do 100% of all the areas, That's, you know, that we're mm -hmm. looking at, you know, where's the municipal bonding, you know, mm -hmm. is probably where those addresses would be funded from would, or, mm -hmm. or whatever additional funds. Mm -hmm. In which event we would apply the incidental rule about crossing through that territory. No, yeah. Overlay, yeah. overlay or overbuild. Um, and who makes that determination? Is it this co committee or commission, the outsourced arbiter of how ARPA funds get spent? Or uh, how do. So how, uh, the state I, has been relying very heavily on guide, like a guide. Guidance, that's what I'm trying right? to think of. Yeah. Yeah. So, and I'm sure that that's where finance and management or others would, but I think that's a question that we should ask. I have that question that's a, right away. Yeah, <laughs> right away, because it really defines. Well, I mean, it's just, a lot it, of how it just, we allocate funding. Well, I, I think yeah. it more allocates how the CUDs think about, you know, when, when we're what, yes, when we're putting together the financing, because it's probably not all our ARPA funds. You know, what addresses are being funded with which funds? So let's put that on the parking lot list very yeah. clearly. Yeah, legal. What what Le is it? What are the choices? Legal. legal. What I have is our can ARPA funding be used to? Let's just start off locations. We need a legal opinion on that. The thread we need a little bit more. One of one other challenge, one other decision we're gonna have to make is are we gonna fund building by another provider to an address that was won by a different company in RDOF if they're not working together? Okay. So it's 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 a, it's a different question of if it's a block that's won by a CUD or won by a provider that's the operator in that area versus where it's a different operator and they're not working with the CUD. Yeah. There's so many layers to this. This, this is yeah. one step to that. Yeah. That's that question. Mm -hmm. I, I have to say, and I'm loving that you know these things, Laura, but there's these references to and there's other funds that are being applied um in this scenario so at some point it'd be great if we talked about what the and maybe we'll get our dashboard from the for the cuds and we'll understand what kind of funding they have outside of arpa or our funding um so because i'm just unclear when you say you know there's other money out there well how much so, is being how much is coming from where act 79 we set up the cud said plan how to get to every address in right. the territory right Act 71, we stood up this board to support the CUDs to get out there, yeah. including and especially thinking about how are you going to finance that plan, right? Right. And so that's the work that, you know, how are you going to finance it? We were fortunate enough to also have a whole slug of federal money come in. Okay, so even and if they're talking about the 2020, 2021, I'm talking about the like, you know, COVID hopefully funded. 250 million dollars that we have to, you know, allocate oh, out. I'm talking about this next. But everything that we are doing, even if that money was not there, 
was still going to happen, right? So the CD still have to figure out how to finance. They're pulling in different buckets of funds. They're pulling in different funds. So in addition to the funds that we're going to be allocating, I mean, that you've got uh, NBRC, um, RUS, you've got, you know, some private funding, you've got all different types of funding and the potential for and the likelihood of, of uh, bonding at some point yeah, down absolutely. the road. Right. And so what we're doing, well, not what we're doing, but the funds that we have now help kind of really lower the cost for affordability and also to get to that bonding. You know, the business makes the business case a lot better. So I that's what that I we're mean. Seeding. We're seeding. Yeah. Yes. So there's a lot of other pieces of funding. I mean, that Pot one of yeah, the, potentially. the NBRC yeah. person, my understanding, hopefully, is is that that is a person that's helping kind of put together the financial stack, right? When you're looking at putting together, building a project, um, I have my economic development hat on, right? So if you're expanding a business or relocating a business, you're, bring, you're bringing together a whole bunch of different sources of funding for that project. Are we, so are we on the same page? Yeah. Okay. And if I could just add just one last parting thought, uh, it sounds like we're probably coming to the end of your need for for us, but um, we talked about RDOF today. Um, the rural local exchange carriers also get high cost support for their territories through a separate program. So you have a similar problem. It's different, but it's similar. Uh, one that you, you may want to also think about as as you proceed um, with uh, uh, projects inside the the RLEC territories. Um, and that we're certainly less uh, knowledgeable on, that might be a good discussion to have with the individual telephone companies. All right. I know less about that world, so I can't actually follow that conversation. Yep. Do you guys? Yeah, I mean, we're talking about the small providers, you know. The, Give an um, example. So uh, Tele Shoreham, yeah. Telephone, Shoreham, Telephone, Topsum, Franklin, right. okay. uh, the TDS companies. Uh, the, the companies, you go back to Corey's first slide, that make up about 16% of the, the geographic uh, territory yeah. on, on that green and blue map. Will that presentation be posted to our meeting? Yeah. Um, We'll send it to you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank anything you. else on Ardoff? Corey and Clay, thank you both thank very you. much. Thank you. It was our pleasure. Good luck. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right, bye -bye. I know this short notice. You did a great job. Okay. Next item on our agenda. Are there any other follow up discussion or questions relative to that conversation? There is one statement that sticks in my head. I think we have to. Like acknowledge it and at some point decide what we're going to do with it. Corey said, these are companies that have already been paid to do something. And historically, both CCI and the ILEX mm -hmm. have been getting high cost support mm -hmm. from the Universal Service Fund and it hasn't made it either practical or they just haven't supplied the service we're looking for them to serve, to supply. So I stop processing a little bit when I hear they sh they have promised to do this anyway. Well, I, I think funding through programs like ours helps ensure mm -hmm. that that level of service is, is done. So it's not like we're giving them an abundance of riches. We're helping control or guide how this happens mm -hmm. through providing additional funding through this program. When they are working with a CED. When they are working with On a, a universal service plan. Or or are in that special category of telcos that are also allowed to pr uh, apply for construction funding independently. Right. Yeah. yeah. I agree with that. I just think we need to have visibility on, on what, what they've been awarded, what what the gap is, and how we can help that gap folks. But I agree with you. I don't want to. The, the, the goal is to get everybody connected. The art is how we do that in each given opportunity. Mm -hmm. And so I don't want to rule anything out, but I want transparency and visibility about what we're doing and not doing 
as it relates to those layers of funding that are available. So as part of our request for submissions, we can bake that in in terms of their what mm -hmm. grants and yes. commitments are included already in their business plan. What commitments do they already have? Or which ones exist that they are not accessing and why, right? And someone may be- Well, we have to keep a roster, I guess, right? It's right. a checklist. I, I, so I think that's right. Yeah. If somebody may deliberately not go for grant money, I don't know why they would, but maybe they are. I, and, I, and that's fine, I just wanna know why. Because that yeah. goes into yeah. our decision making. There could be some barrier. Yeah, know. it could be some risk tolerance thing, some administrative overhead thing. It could be a bunch of things. But if someone's not accessing funding that is known to be available, mm -hmm. that's fine. Just explain it. Can can we list out the available grants that we're aware of and say which you know have them check off? You know, Northern Borders, VC. What is there's VLI. But like Should list them all out and explain. Have them check which ones they've applied for if they haven't applied why because i there's one that we looked at at WEC, and we got to the end of it and we're like we can't apply because we don't meet the criteria we're not a as a as a cooperative we're not a municipal we didn't meet the criteria is, we got thrown out for that singular singular reason is that a step in the pre-construction phase or is that a construction phase step i, I don't know the answer to that but it should be somewhere in the process well in the pre-construction phase it was only open to to cuds and they were asked about previous funding they they've received it uh, was be, also in the capacity survey that's the start of the maturity mile okay. model that was sent out as well but that's it's just really a little bit different you know like here's the list of what you could apply for mm -hmm. or our programs that are out there how many have you applied for it's yeah. possible they may not have known about a particular one and well, just said oh i didn't know about we're that kind one. of helping this, educate in the process exactly. yeah. yeah and this is one of the roles that we do see for the, the broadband project developer as well because there are there's a lot of different funding opportunities out there it all depends on how you thread the needle and making it fit there's a lot of funding for libraries and for schools and connecting unserved students and it's challenging for to keep track of them uh, even for even for Christine and I, never mind the individual CUDs, and that is something that we see this position playing an important part of to make sure that we're leveraging as much funding as we can as possible yeah. from as most, many sources. Most <laughs> of those school programs that you mentioned yeah. are not part of building a fiber network. Yeah. No. Um, so so then the um, the the little thing that's sort of sticking with me that next then is we need that checklist of the funding sources and we need to understand how we're going to see the RDOF sites and where that fits into the CUD plan. Like, Do we need to overtly inquire? Like, will your locations, this could back to the data layer, will your locations, will your universal service plan include or not RDOF locations? And, and ask them to be specific about that, right? Yeah, I, I just think we need to take the macro step back and every CUD has got a number of locations. Some of those today are served 100 by 100, some of those are 25.3, some of those are below 25.3, and that's fine, that's the baseline. I, I'd love to understand how, again, our target is below 25.3. Okay, that's our primary goal. If in serving that goal, we can bump somebody from 25.3 to 100 by 100, that's great. But the primary goal is the below 25.3 sites. And I happen to have a particular Jones about the 4.1 and under sites, because those are just sites that are just, they're useless, right? You, you might as well be in a desert. Thanks, so thank you, I appreciate that. No, it is. And, and if, you, if you really focus on those, you're gonna get a bunch of 25.3 sites along the way, because that's just the way the maps work out. Not 100%, but, um, but I wanna know I want to know the demographics of your territory and how your plan addresses the demographics mm -hmm. of your territory, just like you said, Holly, and it's the data. That's exactly yeah. right. Yeah. And and if you are considering the site served at 25.3 because of RDOF, we just need to know that so that we have, a, because we'd want to know, are you dependent on RDOF in making your plan? Well, I guess that's, I guess that's a question looking back at the, at, at the legislation. Yeah. So does the universal service plan have to cover all locations or only all locations without a plan. Well, that's I think a challenge that's a that fundamental we, question right. for this group. And that's where we're going we're to get into some, that's where we get into some judgment because if, if a plan 
is has a group of sites that it's relying solely on RDOF for, and the RDOF time frame is 2027, and there are a bunch of 401 sites. And if we can do something to accelerate that to 2024 or 2023, we should consider that. A hundred percent. I mean, I exactly. so CUDs are a territory, right? So they're not necessarily just an. I mean, so understanding what your RDOF is, all of the providers, you know, what's in your territory. Um, but 100%, I, I think the CUDs have to be planning for and hopefully are working with or trying to work with the providers, the winners of the RDOF. And, mm -hmm. and in a CUD area, if the winner of those RDOF addresses is not willing to work with the CUD, CUD that's something we should understand, yeah. right? That feels yeah. very risky for those addresses to me, right? And well, something and we actually, should think about. And actually it's a risk factor for both the CED and whoever the recipient was, right? I mean, like- Well, it's, it's riskiest for the people that live at that address. That's right. For, so if you have sure. two, if you have an entity who, you know, that you're in, so- I'm they're tracking with you. you. I'm yeah. tracking with you. I'm yeah. just thinking yeah. up, upstream, everybody's business plan has a, a weakness in it because of if they're not working together. And so that winner, the best case for that winner is to be working with the CUD. So if they're not working with the CUD, to get, because potentially you're getting it further subsidy or assistance in getting that covered. So, so does this, so this is the kind of pronouncement that I think we're, we sort of, this is important information. Where do we categorize, where do we catalog it? And how do we ensure it that it gets posted. <laughs> yeah, so to me, Dan and I just have a little quick aside. This is part of what should be part of the criteria against which we're scoring applications is the totally incorporation of these concepts into the plan and, and yeah. showing that, you know, we're thoughtful about all these different things. And I think it's an offshoot of the policy or guideline or what we call it last time, work, prac, work <laughs> practice <laughs> guideline. Yeah. That we're doing I mean, those we have to give the applicants a roadmap for yes, how we're right. going to evaluate their applications. Yes. That's mm -hmm. what those are. Blessing. And then when the applications come in, we're going to use that those guidelines to score. And that's and that is really my whole compunction about and you can call them policies and call them guidelines. I'm just saying where are the rules of the road that's here? Right. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So, yep. What's important? Um, but it also gets built back into the baseline data and how we're using it. So and we did hear. Corey say that they're not interested in incorporating a layer of what we're doing, that that's a forward-looking planning process layer. And so they'll pick it up when it becomes active. So we'll, we should- That sounds like something that's gonna be negotiated a little bit further probably. So, late, so later like in the idea. agenda today, we are looking at the timeline for construction grants and and how I imagine that we would do it is we would set a goal for when we want the RFP released and then work backwards to determine what decisions we need to make, what policies we need to make to achieve that timeline. And I think a lot of this fits into that discussion as well. Because it's not just our doc, it's as, and as Corey or Clay mentioned that a lot of like, like Shoreham Telephone or some of the other small companies are also getting support and they have requirements to do something by a certain date. How do we accelerate that? How do we make sure that it meets 100 by 100? What do we do if a cut has an operating agreement for those same areas with a different operator? There's all, so much, so much sausage to be made. <laughs> well, and, and I, I would take that all one step further. You know, if I'm a volunteer uh, sitting on a CED and I can say, oh, I see that my district has an RDOF awardee, how do I, I mean, have you ever tried to call SpaceX? How am I to be supported <laughs> in a conversation with um, with that awardee? Well, in the case of SpaceX, I know those were not considered addresses with the plan since they weren't going to meet the 100 by 100 threshold. Okay. But I, I still get the, still get the point, and that is something that, that we can certainly assist with. So uh, that's really what I was thinking, is maybe and this, I throw this out as an idea. I don't know if you're interested, but maybe um, it would be great for this board to invite the RDF awardees in and ask, and just 
suggest to them that working together with the CUD would help us leverage additional funding, if that's our position. I think we better find out if we can. Right. So if we technically can. Yeah, if that's a question that's on right. the board. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah. There's an order to this, but yeah. but you know, rather than um, just say the CUDs, why aren't you dealing with CCI, for example? Um, and I don't know, maybe that's a really easy thing to do, but maybe if that's our preference, maybe we ought to um, inform or encourage the RDOC awardees by inviting them to participate in a conversation like that. One of the big barriers in my mind could be that in order to be an RDOC awardee, you have to be a telecom provider of last resort, an ETC, and that's a whole level of obligation to telephone service mm -hmm. that I am sure most CUDs are not fixated on. So how does mm -hmm. that get sorted out? I don't even know. I don't know about that, actually. I don't well, know I'm CUDs, some will yeah. and some don't. But I'm just saying, you know, now we're talking, you know, FCC obligations and different kinds of certifications. And it's a whole level, business level of engagement. Um, that they have to be aware of and that comes with our dog support. So this is the kind of conversation that we could have if we invited our dog authorities in to talk about whether or not, you know, how and, and express whether or not they would talk about whether they would participate is something else. But we could at least talk about how we would like to encourage them to address uh, collaborate with or engage with CUDs. Yeah, I think that's reasonable. I think we're not prepared to have those conversations. Not yet. I think once we get our, our ducks in a row, then I think we can have a constructive conversation. And all the awardees not named SpaceX are companies that operate in Vermont and, and we know who those people, who those organizations are. So I think it's a high likelihood we'd have productive conversations. And just let's not fixate on SpaceX, Corey said. SpaceX won a bunch of empty census blocks where there's no mm -hmm. locations, exactly. right? And, and even at their maximum, I think it was like 2,000 locations, or at least modeled that way. So they're they're again not to ignore those locations, but they're a small player in this. You know, I doubt we're going to get a lot of face time with them, mm -hmm. but they don't represent the lion's share of the problem we're trying to solve. Either. Right. And also, I want to want to note that all of the I believe. All of the CUDs are talking with the RDOP winners in their block outside of SpaceX. Many have have NDAs with Consolidated, for instance. Uh, obviously, the folks up in the NEK are talking with Kingdom Fiber. Uh, so those discussions are happening. Uh, whether, I guess, the board needs to decide our, our exact role in that of how hard are we pushing? Are we leaving for them to make decisions? What do we do when there's disagreements? Like, just how does this all work? And I would like to hear yeah, first. Part of, part of it, that's their wrinkles to yeah. iron out. Yeah, and I don't want to get, get into the business. Great, great. How are they coordinating with RDAP for right. yeah. and their yep. territory? We shouldn't be trying to solve Exactly. We're, right. No mandates coming from us. Yeah. That's, that's what I was trying to get sure, <laughs> but no <laughs> mandates. Yeah. This is really complicated to unbundle because you have RDAP recipients. The wire centers don't match up with the census blocks. And all of this overlay, which where map mapping will come in to be quite powerful, I think, because you'll have splits in these. And for the recipient or for the uh, applications to talk about, how does this complement or overlay into these districts? Because they could be very complementary with the incumbent. Mm -hmm. And um, to the points made earlier, um, have them speak to that. I don't think we can force them to go get this information, but certainly if they've done the research and they've put their heart into the cooperative efforts, mm -hmm. you know, that score is high. Because okay. in some case, in many cases, with the census block, it's one side of the road is an uh, RDOF census block, the other side isn't, or you have to go through a census block that's RDOF to get to other unserved areas that the FCC decided weren't qualified this time around. So it's I don't know if there's a real solution. <laughs> In fact, you're complementing that census block. All right, I'll have to reach this territory. But you're filling here with some of the CUD work, and they're cooperating over there, which is RDOF. They will build that RDOF territory, perhaps. And together, it achieves the goal that we're seeking to get. 
I, I'm going to just say out loud, and I appreciate what, what you're saying, that it's got to be a design nightmare, actually. Um, I don't agree with my colleagues who have said that uh, we aren't going to give a mandate or it's their wrinkle to smooth out. I, I think we should be encouraging collaboration and that the legislation speaks to that. And so I'm not saying that we won't give money or shouldn't give money to CUDs that don't have an RDOF partner. But I think to the extent that we can help set um, encouragement or guidance for collaborating with RDOF partners, we've got to answer that ARPA question and we've got to figure out how we get, this is for, in the name of getting service to individual locations, we've got to try to leverage all opportunities. And so how the deal gets worked out isn't our uh, effort, but rather making sure we can clear the way, like if it's getting rid of this ARPA versus RDOF funding question, and maybe having um, having a, an opportunity for, um, you know, even if we're just looking at the CUDs and if they're all talking to the RDOF recipients, then maybe we're just good with that, check that box. But we really need to know that that's happening and that we, that the RDOF recipients know that we expect it to happen. But we can't do anything about it. No, but, but what if we, we can put it in our scoring criteria and weigh things heavier or lighter based on Absolutely. That. But we don't want to penalize exactly. a CUD that uh, is not in collaboration with an RDOF For winner the because the RDOF winner will not collaborate. Yes, exactly. And that's why we need to binary. have the conversation with the RDOF. Yeah, I'm not yeah. saying it's a binary co co right. in, yeah. in coordination is better than not in coordination. I'm saying I want I want transparency so that we can because there's going to be a subjective element to this thing about how we award. There's just got to be. Yeah. And in that circumstance where a CUD is making good faith efforts, but there's nobody to collaborate with because of the RDOF recipients just not open to it, we're not going to ding them. We just want to know that and know why. Because we, we don't want to let that opportunity pass unverified. Un, uh, uh -huh. you know like I mean? For example, in Dave Healy's memo to Christine, it is not clear that one of the winners is financially capable of meeting the obligations. There's a red flag. I don't want to mandate that they work with somebody that's not financially viable. However, right. however, exactly. in support of Brian's point, the folks that are on this call are not necessarily RDOF awardees. Mm -hmm. And so how do they know we're even having this conversation? I just think it's a good thing for us to make sure mm -hmm. that we've reached out to RDOF awardees and let them know that we sure. want to understand where they're at, that we encourage their participation with CUDs, mm -hmm. that we under want to understand how these funds intersect and how the delivery of service mm -hmm. will happen. So that's, the, I, I just want to make sure that we get the word out there. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's try to keep moving this along. Any other discussion on this topic right now? Uh, yeah, I, I would actually like, Madam Chair, if we could get some clarity um, from the department about the the mapping. And I would like our staff to, so I don't know if we're there yet or not, but I think we need to start settling down back to our previous conversation. Like we're not, we're, we're actually not going to be creating two different databases. And mm -hmm. so, you know, there's going to be another layer uh, to the state's telecom data and mm -hmm. how that um, how we cooperate with the department to get that done, I think is is something I think we need to start hashing out. Not okay. if, not if, right. but how. We basically got told no. <laughs> well, well, I don't well, know that we did. That, I don't know that we that did, but let's clarify. The process okay. doesn't make it yeah, let, let me back up. Like we have the interactive broadband now. Uh, there's nothing when we have our GIS uh, contract done, there's nothing that, says we can't create another layer using the same E911 addresses that can be overlaid onto that map. We can add any layers we want to public data. I, I, so as a, so <clears throat> I don't think we want to, um, I don't think it's in Vermont's best interests or CUD's best interests or a private provider's best interests uh, or taxpayers' best interests 
for there to be two sets of data that it, that exist separately somewhere that are tracking different um, different uh, build outs of of addresses you know that we're we're, uh, we're you know tracking private and you know as CUD comes in here and we're tracking so just I think that conversation needs to how how we are working with the um, with the department on, I'll take that. on that, yep. uh, you know, how we're going to sort through that. And yep. I think we still have the elements of what we're going to map, but mm -hmm. how are we going to collaborate with? Yeah, I thought I thought we had just said at the beginning with that early discussion that this is this will be a topic of a subsequent meeting and we'll take this data. on the phone. The data, but the how with the DPS oh, is what I I'm do, asking. I do it all together. It's okay, it's it's great it's great it's it's but it's a conversation. Okay. It's, it's started. Yeah, no, I will have that conversation beforehand. I'll talk to Julian. Okay. Moving along. <laughs> Next item on the agenda is grant scoring criteria. So first, I guess I, I want to ask, like, how you all want to do this? It can be as simple as saying that you. Uh, yeah, we sure can be. We can go through the the scorecard. We can say that you trust the staff to do this. We can go through what it says in the RFP for how we're scoring it, which aligns with the scorecard. I. I that's the feedback I want before I start launching in and going through all the different questions we're asking and the points associated. If you're going to marry the scoring to the RFP physically, how would you do that right now? I would say that I use the RFP to inform the scoring. <laughs> <laughs> so it seem I like went you through the just, questions. That's what I did. Don't you think we should just walk through the scorecard and get yeah. through that? If you're open to that, we can certainly do that. That works for me. Okay. So in the board packet, there was a PDF of it. I'm going to pull up the actual, I use SurveyMonkey to make this better. So let me pull that up and we'll go through that in a second here. You know, I'll just say, because we don't have our um, task guidelines officially established, it's hard to look at these scoring guidelines and make sure they incorporate some of those decisions that we've been making. So, so this is the grant scorecard. And for the people at home, this is more for internal use. So there's not all that much explanation. For those of you that have applied for funding, you'll see these questions align very closely with the RFP and the other survey we sent, sent out. How I imagined it is that this calculates a score, depend, uh, applications will be recommended for funding if they're over a certain score, the board will still take other feedback and look at individual line items and everything. But this is kind of the, the baseline. Uh, it's to for evaluating the grant applications as well as evaluating as part of the risk assessment stuff. There's a few questions in here that were taken from the state uh, state of Vermont's risk assessment survey. So first, uh, it's very basic contact information amount requested. Uh, Top question here, universal service confirmation. I have a question. Is it all on-grid addresses or is it all locations as defined in the act? What are we trying, what is the universal service that we're trying to get the CUDs to address? All underserved addresses in their in their territory. Yeah, but that's not all on-grid addresses. So this well, is all on-grid. That's in the application it does specify on-grid. On-grid being the electrical grid? Uh, yeah, that's what the universal thing and is. isn't it the underserved on an un and underserved yes. addresses. Yeah, but it doesn't say that. Yeah. Here. As I said, this is internal in the RFP itself. Oh, it does this have, is internal. This is internal. This is for when you and I and Christine and others go to take our first pass through the applications to check the boxes of things that we ask that we ask them for in the RFP itself. In so, the RFP itself, it defines what we what we want in terms of a universal service commitment. And that was based on the, the feedback from the board in terms of the exact definition taken from the legislation on grid on grid addresses that are underserved or unserved. So less no, than 25 locations. Okay. So, clear. so uh, that's what I was saying in terms of there's not much explanation here because this is Internal. for us. Yes. So, so that's the first thing, 50 points, it's going to be, we can't really approve any application unless that's what they are saying that they are committed to doing. Uh, then we take so some time. Quick, how did you, 
where did the 50, 10, how did the points get derived? Uh, that's where I'm looking for, for feedback. Okay, so this is your first. What's the total number of points that you can possibly achieve here? The way SurveyMonkey works, it makes it a little bit challenging because if you have different options, like there's some grants that we're going to get that are just applying for capacity. Some are applying for pre-construction. So if I don't award the, if they haven't applied and I don't award the points, it's a different point total. So that's why I have the, the 250, 210. Um, I've tried many times to add it up. Go for it. <laughs> wow. I mean, otherwise you can't. You can't discern whether or not 50 is right. a material. Well, it kind of, this first one is really a go, no go. So, I'm, yeah. you know, I'm. Put 275 for it and you get credit for it. Thank you. Waitress. <laughs> wow. So, two, so 275, I don't know for sure if that's what SurveyMonkey said because of how they, it's strange how they calculate it, but we, I, I plan on doing it by <laughs> manually like that as opposed to. So, Survey monkey. So the question on this first one is, if they don't have a universal service fund, we don't go any further, right? right. So why is it not just so by even yeah, it's binary. Go it's no fine. Go. Well, it's just if they don't get these 50 points, there's no way it's going to be approved, period. Well, this is kind of a gate to even apply, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's one of those things that will be listed. And as you have to a lot of points to it for the system to <laughs> Yes. Work. You okay. should state that. Yeah, but as I said, this is huge. We're making 275 <laughs> points, and that way you're never. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's what I was trying to do with 50. And as I said, this is internal. This is for us. In the application, it does, like, it's one of the requirements they need to state they have a universal service plan. So, yeah, go ahead. Oh, um, just that discussion alone, it sounds like we're letting the tool drive. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Us instead of us driving the tool. Well, we don't even need it's, to put the question in here. For our I mean, I like the vehicle yeah. for the discussion. The other well, way more is what it comes up as an in, when you press the submit button, it comes up as an incorrect answer, and that would be okay, no go. The other way to do it is start. Everyone starts with whatever the total is, two fifty. Everyone starts with two fifty. So basically, you answer question three, yes, you get two hundred and fifty points, and then all subsequent questions deduct points, so that. If you answer the question strongly, it's zero points deducted, and you maintain your 250 hmm. through that question. Or if you're less than ideal, you deduct a couple of points, and now your 250 is a 245, and you work your way down. That way, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, it's, well, the, tool it's, as the tool does not support that. That's the challenge, at least the, um, at least the version we have <laughs> access to. So that's why it was more of like uh, you're trying to, the way this was scored is you're trying to gain points, and I said, set of how many points you had to get to approve. So it's it's still doing the same thing. And as I said, this is a guide for when we come back to with the applications to the board. And so we continue the conversation on the merit of each of these and make notes and not hold ourselves up on the tool. Yeah, like do, do we really need to, the, and I'm wondering, do we need to focus more on the question or the points? I mean, well, I, I just, so, 50 is 18 percent of 275. I just like it's just a it's mind blower. So, this me. is a yes or no gate. Yeah, it's like so it's like don't it's it like I you don't even score. Know. Yeah, 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 yeah I would, don't I would just stop point, at that. Don't even point points to it. It's like, no, if it's no, it takes it out of the yeah. whole part, part, part of the challenge is, is no one is gonna say that they don't have it because every all the CUDs do have it and they're the only eligible applicants. So, it's just a check. It's just a checkbox for being able to score this and being able to say and how it's we've a, made the application. It's a reminder that they yeah. have to do this. Yes. It's just a reminder that it's part of getting this. It's more of an accountability for us. Right. They yeah. know. I mean, yeah. they know. And, but yeah. it's what the law says. It's like a certification, yeah. right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. We're, just, we're just certifying that we checked that off, that that was in the application. I mean, that's the best way to, yeah, to so put it. Make it a certification, not score it. Yeah, this certification is there or it's not. Yeah. Okay. Because that, the yeah. other thing is, is that we can't confirm it because how would you prove it? That they have they've, a universal been, service plan? They've been asked to include the language that's in their mission yeah. statement or what the, or the plan or yeah, anything in the RFP. To. Yeah. Yeah, but in my mind, okay, so <laughs> I know that like we don't want to go here, but in my mind, the way you would confirm it is when we get to the point of being clear about our data, We'd say, okay, we have a business plan that addresses the right number of locations that reflects 
our baseline data allocation for that CUD. This also goes to another question of that capacity is something that we're going to be funding in this. In some cases, we're going to be funding updating business plans or finishing business plans. Understood. Having a business but plan is not required for the pre-construction. It's required for the construction. Okay. So that's that's that's. The, I know, but you, you can make an exception to every statement. But the fact of the matter is, is that's what a universal service plan is. And so whether they have it today or plan to have it tomorrow, it's a way of saying, yeah, we've confirmed because we agree this is the number. We, the CUD and the BCBB agree that this is the number to be served in the universal service plan. Given the time frame they have and we have, is it in the state of the data, is it fair to ask that question at this moment or not? I don't think we can answer. Yeah, so. So we, we're, I'm just it, saying we're doing the best we can right yeah, now. It's but, a great question. I'd love if they could answer that question and we could verify it, but the state of our data doesn't allow either party to do that. Right? They, they well, can answer do. that question. They can. The they question can. Should they have to, right? I mean, right. they're planning for something, right? I mean, but no, 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 not this question. The, number, yeah. the, the how many locations are in your like? I'd love to right up front to know how many locations, locations in your territory. Years. How many are 100 by 100? How many are 25 three or more? How many are less than 25 three? How many now that's a universal that's service data. plan commitment. I would love well, that. Well, we have the 2019 data. data. Yeah, we have the 2019 data, and that's the base data for for everyone. Like we've asked them to that? include that well, on the application. Yeah, but. You have to have them say what they're using, not that we have it. Okay, I'm, I'm actually going to, let's see if this switches here. I'm going to quickly go back to what we've asked for, because this might ask, answer a bunch of those questions. Okay, so this is, the, this is the RFP. Let me get back to where we're going through here. And you'll see that I, when, when we drafted this, I wanted them to be able to create an application that we would view it, we'd understand it, that we could send it to somebody that doesn't know anything about CUDs, they would understand what this is about, what the group is about, and what the history is about. So the first, so let me go back here. So right there. This is great. Yep. This is great. Yeah. So it's right there. Then we go into current capacity. This aligns very much with the whole scoring thing. Current board members, uh, advisors, contra current contractors, like what are they doing? How are they managing money? Other sources of funding, we want them to list all grants they were awarded in the, in the previous two years. Source, date, amount, and brief okay, summary. Well, well, let's just stick to this, though, not to the whole. Yeah, I think I mean, what he's trying to do is show you that we, yeah, this will be yeah, yeah, part, yeah. part And here's the and, universal and so service. I'm, I'm cool that if they've answered those questions, yeah. Yeah. you could say yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> that's that, that's where, I'm, where I'm at here yeah. uh, with this. So I, I, I think it's a zero pointer myself, but. Um, yeah, we can yes or no. We, we can certainly we make it a, zero, a, a yes or no or a zero pointer. Like it's this is just to help guide us. So when we come back in a discussion, we're and that that is also the challenge with us. The way we structured it is a certain amount available to each CUD. So they're competing with us saying yes or no as to whether their plan is reasonable, strategic, and whether they meet the conditions of the law. They're not competing against each other necessarily. In the case of this grant program, that'll be different for most likely for construction. Uh, so, section. So, I wanted to know if they have an operating agreement or other partnerships. Uh, feasibility study. We want the link. Business plan. We want the link or status update. And we also have a little note encouraging them to request additional funding because, as uh, I can't remember who sent it out, but we've all noticed in Act 71 how they define business plan is different than how the business plan was defined in the broadband innovation grant. And we want all these groups to be ready to apply for construction funding uh, potentially by by December. Uh, yeah. So that's something that's highly encouraged for for the CUDs. And I'm just going to note that I sent that out. Okay. And I, I excerpted it from the business, the innovation grants and sent it to you by email, so it's in your partner email because the definition of feasibility grant and business plan are. Right different than they are in 71. And that would that has already been shared to the, the CUDs and we're looking into to other other ways to potentially fund any updates and see if they can, can do it themselves versus hiring somebody or, or you put that word out there uh, to try to find out more information. But that's just something to, to note in there. So, Rob, from your perspective, does this then pretty much just mimic the sequence of this pretty much? It's, it's mimicking it for the most part. There's a few other questions in there that were from the survey that we sent out. 
okay. those are mostly the risk assessment. Like, okay. have you have you been audited? Did they have findings? What's your accounting system? Okay. So it's asking more yes or no for some things that we're asking them to explain. So, like we, so, so can I ask under this human capacity thing, and I, because I'm not going to be allowed to ask these questions of you when I'm sitting there scoring, I'm going to ask them now. So, um, but it, it, do we really care how what the number of committees? Are? I mean, like, would this penalize people unnecessarily? Like, the number of committees that doesn't talk about effectiveness or workload or anything, and how many board members volunteer outside of the monthly meeting? Is that something that can be well, you know, validly me, reported? I just I I, I do think it's ex, it's example of maturity because we I'm mean, I'm not going to mention CUD names, but the active CUDs are doing a lot more work with committees. There is you know and the the you know on the other extreme there's not much going on at all. So I did so I do think so Rob this is the about, way that we're trying to figure out how structured they, they are. We're trying to separate it from what we know about the CUDs. Yeah. We're trying to have something that's more of a, like, we're trying to assign, assign a number to it. This goes back to the whole maturity discussion. And it's not perfect. Uh, there's some questions like that we have in here, like we asked how many employees. Well, a more advanced CUD that wants to access the bond market, there's an advantage to not having employees. So what do we do? What do we do in, in terms of that question? Like there's there's things that, there is some variability and there is some subjectivity that's going to go into all these things. Like that's why this isn't the end all. I, my, my assumption is if the, if the applicants follow the directions and answer all the questions, that they're going to score really well on this. And then it is up for us to figure out between them to make a more subjective call. I get, I get where you're at. Can I ask, I would, um, I want to volunteer to join Holly in reviewing the first few or, or whatever the pre-scoring because I, that's going to make me more invested in the content and familiar and it's just going to help me. So yeah, yeah, I, I think it's very helpful. Yeah. I think it's very helpful just to understand the understand each of these CUDs. Like that's a challenge I have is I have so much information up here yeah. from working with them yeah. that uh, a it's lot of like time. It's like a blind check for us. To do yes. Yeah. Wait, Christine, you had a comment? Yeah, I'm just wondering from a process standpoint whether you may want to just delegate this exercise to this subcommittee because it, you know, it's going to take you a long time to get through this. Yeah, we're not going to make it through this we're today. Gonna gonna go. Go. Yeah, we're There's no way. Okay. That's a good suggestion, Laura. I'm processing that <laughs> okay. because that's where I was going. Like, I have to leave at 12.15. But yeah, right. uh, yeah. I think we should have some sense of how we're going to score before the scoring happens. I mean, we should have some right. consensus. Yeah, I'm suggesting that a subcommittee review the score. And so the consequence of that is... Can we come back to this at the next meeting and say I, our homework is to go review this? Because it's, it's, as Laura the, said, I, I, can't, I can't read this. We didn't get the packet until this morning. I can't read this and, yeah. and give feedback. Yeah, maybe that's it. We, it's the, this is the challenge. In the RFP, we said that we the staff would make a recommendation to the board within seven days, and then the board would make a decision on the applications. Like this was in the uh, as you said, this is all based on the RFP that has been been out there in terms of okay, in terms but of the scoring. It's our RFP. You're held responsible to the board. The board can give us a get out of jail free card for this first round of one application. Well, but, there'll be many more, but it's also a matter if we change in the RFP, we have to go through a process of amending the RFP. So are we changing the RFP or are we waiting the criteria? We're just changing the time frame given the Yeah, we're waiting the criterion of seven days response. But we're not in contractual, we're not contractually bound to the applicant to respond in seven days. Well, I'm trying to help. We're not going to change the RFP, but we're addressing the criteria and the waiting of the responses. The RFP right, exactly, exactly. RFP yeah, no, no, so, He's worried about the time. Yes, how will we get the feedback in seven days? Because our next meeting right now isn't scheduled to October. That's right. That's And I am also concerned about that. Okay. So I am also concerned about that. The consequence of doing this, which is something I support, puts us into October, and that is a problem for me. Like the, the other option. like we're mm -hmm. twerking the yeah. CUDs around. Like the, the other option is to, we, we fill this out, we don't even have scores to it, but it's used as a reference guide for the board when making decisions. 
So it kind of is yes. I want you to no. score. I want to. Yeah. You no, know, there has to be some some, some of us have time to dive in and do a more detailed. There's no way I can review things on a really granular basis. I just can't. Humanly can't do it. I want you to score. I want to score for each one. And how else do you go side by side? Exactly. Yeah. It's got to be scored. I guess I guess going back to the side by side. In some ways, we aren't doing side by side since it's not they're, they're not competing against each other. There's no, but if you give a points. score, it gives you a relative sense of this. Madam Chair, I would like to suggest that we don't do that. Date that we've held for our work. Yes. Which is what date? October 23rd, 28th. 28th. I'm it's away. still two weeks. I'm away. away the 27th of September. September. What we can do is give feedback um, electronically to the group. I think we can respond to this and say. We could schedule an emergency meeting early next week that's just for an hour to approve the scoring. I think we have to give 48 hours notice just to approve the scoring that we're associating with this. And that would allow things to move forward and score them. Then we can get it, we can review them as a work group and come back uh, potentially on the 28th to approve these applications or. Yeah, I just I, I'm going to I'm going to time out here because I, you know, workload wise, even if we scheduled a meeting, I don't have time to look at this and digest. It's like it's the reality factor. So the, that's the, kind the, of a problem, though, yeah, frankly, yeah. I know, but it's it's reality. Well, but when it's delegated to the committee, yeah, that's my point. To, delegated to exactly. If there's a subcommittee, I'm happy yeah. to do that. But to have us all meet and try to make. Then let's do that. Yeah. Are you I'm totally comfortable. OK, so so we have a subcommittee. And so that's my point. Use we'll, the subcommittee to make. It's going to make a that's going to put something forward to the board prior to. Well, that's up to you. Um, I would delegate this action and you guys make sense of it and make a recommendation okay. go. I make a recommendation or go ahead and score. Go ahead. Go. You put that trust in our fellow board members. So, so to me, it's a two-step process. I need to review this mm -hmm. and give feedback on it. You will do the same. We need to align that feedback. Rob's, and then so the three of us or the four of us need to come up with a new version of this based on that feedback. Or ideally, it's perfect, and our feedback says, great, nothing's changed. Yep. And, it's a, it, and it's aligning with the RFP that has yep. already been yes. issued. Yes. It is right. not saying, you know, uh, it, it's exactly. not trying to recreate. I, I, basically, I want to sit down with the RFP and just yep. side by side and go through it. If we don't like what we've sent out on the RFP, too bad. Yeah, that's I mean, not that's bad. Whole that's whole scoring right. okay. around. And Rob and I will commit the time. We need Fine. committee to do Yes. Yep. Yeah. Right. I make a motion that we set up a subcommittee to review the grant scoring matrix as submitted in our agenda, and that subcommittee is comprised of Holly and Brian. I'm happy to work on that subcommittee, but I am not happy to score. I don't want to score. Well, I, I don't think it we doesn't can. make a lot. It's not helpful to do both. For the subcommittee, it can't be more than two people and Great. a staff That's person right. because of corner issues. Fine. Okay. So we'll, perfect. We'll work with you. All right, so I made a motion. Is there a second? second. All right, Dan seconded that motion. Although, any di more discussion? Oh, just, just time frame to have this done. Yeah, really, we need to know what the can you, next week is. You next. need to have can it done in. Yeah. Say again. Can, can tomorrow? you meet tomorrow to go over this? I need to. So we need I'm, to have time to review it. Yeah, it I, so staff continues to forget that we actually have <laughs> to have time to review things. So I need I need alone time with the RFP and this mm -hmm. to side by side develop my comments and feedback. Then I'm thinking the and I think each of you well, at least Holly does. Then I think we get together and we either email that feedback together to get it going, or then we just hash through it on a phone call. And then the outcome of that try to time bound it so we say yep we're gonna have this done by Tuesday maybe. Wow. I don't know what's feasible. Yeah. And. Uh, and then and then we're good and we get to score and 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 you know it will probably would make a lot of sense because i think you can talk me off ledges brian and maybe i can ask questions that you'll be successful in responding to that we don't have to bring to staff let's try to get our a consolidated response okay, is that all right yep. and by we'll, tuesday by tuesday so yeah, the committee will issue a response to the whole board yes by Tuesday the 21st. Or, or do you want us to talk to, I mean, I, this is just a question, it's not a suggestion. 
or do you want us to talk to to Rob and Christine about our comments and then give a report to the board? Yeah, so you guys have some internal work you're going to do, but on the 21st, you report out to the board. This so is, that means okay. that we need to do our analysis on Friday and Saturday, talk to the staff on Monday, and then have a report out on Tuesday. Yes, is that doable? I'm just kind of aware of where the work is inappropriately um, caddy office on the board. And I just, I'm, I'm starting to say, you know, like, yes, we need to respond to these CEDs, but we also need to be able to be realistic and being able to get our work done. To, to be fair, the RFP has been out there and, and available, and this was printed out in the board packet sent you sent yesterday yes when we're the, meeting every week it but is we're a challenge talking about this that yeah, was so, in the board packet so so let me just propose that went out yes is there a problem with setting having these two evaluate this by tuesday and then having the, the response to the board by thursday so i'm more concerned about the when timeline to the cuds so that's for me that's the place that we work from and then build as much time and space for everybody that's doing the work. So what's the goal so, for so the CUDs? What did you tell CUD them? The first, the first application came in on Tuesday. From? Is that necessarily relevant? Why not? Tuesday the date. Public information. Fourteen. It came in. For, it came in from uh, Maple CUD. I'm okay. expecting applications from several others early next yeah, week. Yeah, but Tuesday, Maple CUD. Tuesday being Tuesday of this week. So under the rules of the RFP, we would be owing them a response to their application by well, Tuesday. Well, it's a staff recommendation to the board, right. and Sorry, then the board right. decides at the next yeah. meeting. Right. This is helpful. So you, we have to, you have to, we have to have a response to the yeah. first staff. Staff, staff has to make a recommendation to the board on, on the twenty-first Tuesday. Tuesday. Yeah. Yes. That's a, that that was a bad rule. Is it working days or is it? Days. I mean, if it's working. We can say working days. Yeah, that'd be specified that gives us more. To, to where the yeah. staff can do that. That's actually, that's and then, yeah. And then, is there a time for that, you? For yeah, you. exactly. We can't, can't. I don't think we should do. I've always understood business to be a working day. Like, is the and the following week, is there a day as a board that we can meet for a short meeting to go only addressing applications, so we could move that going forward? Uh, we we also do need the, the the grant agreement as as well is the next step after that. And I know you were going to say. Well, I think I think the recommendation was that this subcommittee would make those decisions. No, the subcommittee is just going to review this matrix. Oh, okay, all right. Well, the, well. It, it, the subcommittee is going to review the matrix and review the grant applications. Review the grant applications and score and them. Just, and make, oh, right. Why not? That's true. And then make a recommendation. Part that that our response is part of actually. Okay part of the staff's recommendation to the board. Right. Well, why don't I do this too? I will share I will share with the with the board uh, the first uh, the first application that came in. There's some information that is confidential. Be clear. Uh, it's a, and you that may help you with going through the scoring to see how it all aligns. So you'll have the RFP, you'll have the first response um, and you'll have the, the and you'll have the scoring system. Will you send those three things out to the subcommittee that Again, I yes. Don't, I, don't, I don't know if I can put my hands on the original RFP, the RFP, the scoring guide, and the first response. They treat, yes. We'll treat that as confidential. Yes. Parts of it will be, but all applications are confidential we'll until they're accepted okay. anyway. But yeah. And here's an open meeting lot question. Since we're a subcommittee of this board, do we have to warn meetings of that subcommittee? No. It's not a subcommittee. No. It's a working group of less than a quorum. Yeah, you're not a quorum. Yeah, we're, no, we're not a quorum. We're going to go on yeah. the right. Right. work and you and I are going to speak. Right. And then, and then I just want to make sure that we're like, okay, so I want to be clear with our process, seven days staff has to make a recommendation to the board about this first application that was received on Tuesday. So that's the 21st. So they're making a recommendation to us. We are not scheduled to meet until October. Four, five, six, seven. The seventh day is the 23rd. Our next meeting 23rd, is September excuse 28th. Me. Excuse me. That's right. It's seven business days. So our next meeting is in October, or are we meeting, We're on, meeting the, on the 28th? We are meeting on the 28th. Are we meeting on the 28th now? We had originally said no, that. No, I think we just I just cannot meet on the 20th. Oh. Well, you made the recommendation, so you're up. That's true. 
as long as we have quorum. So my my just fine for folks just to set the expectation for CUD world. So we're seven business days, and we are meeting then, and at our next meeting are are likely making funding decisions or can make funding decisions at our next meeting. On the 28th, the one I have on the calendar. Well, there will be, there will others, be others that come in. But it won't have the seven days for review. You won't have the impact of the subcommittee. It Well, I just want to be realistic that on the, by the 28th, you'll have the recommendations that you received on the 21st or on the 23rd. So, so when will, when are you expecting other applications to come in? Early next week, if not today or tomorrow. And so if we have grant applications, pre-construction grant applications that come in on the 21st, right, they would be out on of the, the yeah. seven day right. time frame. And so then they would, that decision would be moved into the October meeting. It's seven days to review from. So if they, if an application came in tomorrow, yeah, we have to have a review back by the following One. a recommendation to the board, and it says the board addresses it at their next board meeting. Five, so six, those would seven. be on the 28th. Yeah, you could make recommendations on the 28th, and it could be addressed on the 28th. Yeah. I'm but just worried about how yeah. we're going to handle this as your subcommittee. That's all. Yeah, the point is you're making is there's a there's a cutoff date. It's not. So, We're, you know, if things yeah. come in next Monday, they aren't going to get reviewed on the No, they will. Well, they will because the seven days ends up being the following Tuesday, which is before a Thursday board meeting. I know, but this committee, this subcommittee has to review them. They'll have had they'll have, seven days. They'll have had seven days okay. to review them and make a recommendation okay. to the right. board. Got it. Got it. But, but the CUD will not receive feedback until after the board meeting? Uh, CUD, depending on what the recommendations are, like we could request that the CUD attend the board meeting to answer any questions. If there are questions that need to be answered in executive session, that's something that, that could also happen. And if we don't have enough information based on the application, we don't have to recommend it for funding. That is true. There's a negotiation yeah. process. Um, we, need, we need a calendar. We need, we need a so two, two requests, and I don't mean to take this. Can we always have in the minutes the date and time and location of the next board meeting? Yeah. So it's always there. And then the second thing is all of these dates of meetings and submissions. And, I like, like it when it's out on, on the agenda, too. Yeah, but better, whatever. That works great. Either one. And then, um, I just lost my thought. Oh, and then tracking all of these dates of incoming applications, review period, recommendation to the board time frame like well when it comes in actually to the committee i think it would be great if the staff could maybe put on there what the relevant timelines are yeah, sure. yeah. 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 let me check and make sure let me check and make sure i guess it wouldn't even let me make sure this was tuesday not monday that it was that it came in so, so we're going to put the timeline on the, on the application. Each one should have its own timeline, right? Well, this is going to help it if it was on Monday, Rob. So, you know, it isn't going to happen faster. Did you hear me? Yeah. It isn't yeah, going to happen day isn't faster if it arrived day. Monday. Yeah. Okay. All right. So I think we're getting there. Uh, put the timeline in the application. And so. There's a possibility that if someone got in an application tomorrow, it would be included in this group's, in the board's review on the 28th. Okay. On the 28th, it, then if we're making decisions, are we bound by the in-person rule for, for voting? No. No. We can do it all remote. We can remote I've never heard of that. Okay. No, sorry. It's my legislative okay. hat. So, Rob, this matrix that you sent out, it's in this packet. Are you asking for feedback from the board? I, Are you making a recommendation we adopt this? I was making a recommendation you adopt it, is what I was mm -hmm. what I was suggesting. There was one item I had a question on that I didn't know if we should just not include it in the pointing schedule. Other than that, this this aligns exactly with what was in the RFP. Are you so are, I'm just saying Patty, when I'm you just, say matrix, are you talking about this this question? Yes. Okay. Right. So right. so we have voluntarily we have some volunteers, Brian and Holly, that want to go through this. It's not a requirement. 
No, it's not a requirement. So you could very well leave this up, leave this up to staff, and then you do have subjective ability to when you review the actual grant applications. This is something that provides you with additional feedback from staff on each proposal, our view of the proposal. You will have access to all materials and you could vote to ignore any recommendation the staff makes. That is what the board is empowered to do. It's a question of whether the board wants to get, and this is where I started the conversation, whether we wanted to get into the weeds or whether you wanted mm -hmm. to trust that the scoring, the scoring was gonna be fair and give you enough information to move forward. Like we're not just going to tell you this application scored this number. We're going to give you a printout of the questions that they answered. So in some ways, you could judge for yourself of how you want to relate the different scoring. Whether well, it's very clear in the RFP of the the criteria we are using to guide the applications. This was supposed to be a tool to make to add some numbers to concepts and questions that we asked, and to make it an easier roadmap for you to make your final review of the applications. So that I'm is just, another option. Is right. just, I'm just yeah. very conscious of the fact we can't slow this ship down. We shouldn't slow the ship down. I, I get the, the need and desire to perfect things because I type A personnel, I want to do that myself. But I would defer to staff personally and let you run with it, especially being on you know board role, staff role. Just want to finish. Yeah. Um, it might not be perfect and that might not be... Um, you know, the absolute end all, I'm not criticizing your work, Rob, I'm just saying there's a certain amount of trust as board members we put in staff. And rather than hold things up, I'm going to defer to, I would recommend we defer to staff in the event board members want to review this, give feedback quickly back to Rob, do so rather than set up a very difficult timeline process here. My understanding is you have to, you have to, Within seven days, make a recommendation to the board. And in our next regular scheduled board meeting, which is the 28th, we will take up any RFPs um, that have come in in that timeline and that have a score. We will take that up on the 28th. Comment by the 17th. Right. May I comment on that? Yes, yeah, so we had several hands that came up. Holly will start, and then Brian, then Laura. As long as I'm not asked if I approve this, I could do that. As long as we mm -hmm. agree that if we use it and find that we need to adjust it, we can. I mean, that's Agreed. I think that's the the caveat. Because yeah. you are also putting reliance on doling out millions of dollars on this framework. And if we find that it's not not, not reliable in terms of some mm -hmm. level of objectivity, in terms of some level of mechanics, mm -hmm. then we owe it to this group and the public to fix it. I'm just looking for quick clarification. So the pre-construction phase of this and the pre-construction funding that's available, am I correct in that you had done the math early and shown us, Rob, about the breakdown of those funds to each CUD based on their demographics, right? Yes, based on their unser on and underserved right. addresses without without a plan. We can address that later. Exactly. But yeah. But you had that initial breakdown and you showed not only the percentages mm -hmm. but the dollars. Correct. That I mean that is the construct for the pre-construction awards and, and what the application process is doing is they're giving us certain information so that we can become very comfortable with authorizing that level of awards and that distribution based on that methodology, correct? Correct. Great. Thank you. Laura? Uh, just for our next board meeting with these proposals, uh, with anything that the staff is bringing forward for us to consider, I want to just say out loud, we cannot receive it the day before. I, I feel we have it's to have hard. it at least. It makes it hard. It has to be at least two days. Well, we agree. I, I don't even think two days is enough. To but but, but uh, I, I will commit to, I mean, to two days. Well, what as, as staff, what we can do is as the applications come in, even before they are scored, we can share them with you. So if you have time and you want to start reading them, if you want to go that in depth with each application, you have the ability to do so. Uh, the scoring we will get done as soon as possible. Like I, it's my my plan. Like if we we're going with 
going with this, my plan was to try to score the first application tomorrow to go to go through it. And that is kind of just it's it's providing you with a guide for your review. And I will get that as soon as possible. But I will send over the application, all the materials as soon as it goes arrives in our, our mailbox. I want to be able to approve an application if it's appropriate at our next meeting. And so I, it has I have to have it at least. So so there's a, so there's a cutoff. If the application comes in within 48 hours, essentially that's gonna have to be moved to the next. You couldn't do it anyway, right? I mean, well, I mean you could. I guess you could. Yeah, I guess could, you could. could but, yeah, you yeah, could make but it. That doesn't I, I think we I think we I think it's fair to to say and to say to the CUDs if we don't get an application that's if there's not at least seven days before the next board meeting, it's very likely it's going to get punted to the following yeah, board yes, meeting. Yes, I, yes. I think that's I think that's yeah. a fair expectation yeah. for everybody. So then everybody has access to that application for at least seven days. I, is that say that again clear, so, clearly? So if that's where it's very succinct. Okay. If an application comes in only seven days before a board meeting, it's not going to be addressed at the next board meeting. We may have a staff recommendation, but it's not not necessarily going to be addressed at the at the board meeting. So really, any application I'd like to talk to CUD World, any application that doesn't arrive before next Thursday is not going to be reviewed and approved or denied or whatever on the meeting that we're talking about having on the 28th. And is so the, so the staff can st it can be scored and there can be a recommendation made, but until the board votes through a motion on that application, it's not in effect. Is that correct? Correct. Great. The board yes. has the final say yes. on this. Thank you. Right. So right. if the board needed to punt, need the board time. needed to punt. Yeah. Yeah. If the board had other questions, we encourage you since you'll have the application for seven days, like you are, there's nothing that stops us from reaching back out to the application. Be like, I have a question on this. As an I, I don't think so. <laughs> so I'm hearing a further. I mean, I, I'm hearing further. You say that we will have them for seven days, which is different, which is additional information. I'm saying that you will have the. If I'm sending over the application the minute it comes in, and we're not gonna, we're not committing to approving or rejecting any application on the 28th. Anything that doesn't come in by next Thursday is not gonna. What is okay. next Thursday? 23rd. It's, I don't. That's seven, seven days no. from the next board meeting. Business days. Let's see. But we no. Do business. The 28th is the next meeting. board meeting. Right. So, so you got to. So it's not next Thursday. One, we're talking about it's three, tomorrow. Four, five, six, seven is the 17th. And and by the way, it just having oh, the application in hand isn't so. enough. You need the scoring. So Rob is saying he's going to send that to us. We we also would need the recommendation right from the staff. I, which could not come the day before. I mean, that would. That's be, right. No. I still want that at least two days. No. I, and it's, I'll make it a priority to review all the applications. It's going to be 48 hours plus. All right. Timelines are all screwed up here. I'm yeah. not following I'm, this. Yeah, I was. Just, I meeting? was thinking the meeting was Thursday the 30th. I thought the third. I thought. The, I thought the um, two weeks from today was the 28th, but I apparently cannot add. Okay. <laughs> I have a calendar here. We have a meeting on the 28th in the afternoon. Would it be fair that we get material on the 23rd? Okay, so and then there's a, that's the cutoff. Whatever's in our packet on the 23rd is what we will consider. If it's not in the packet, it's not on the table. And for it to be in your packet on the 23rd, four, five, it would have it would. It doesn't, the staff doesn't have seven days to review anything that isn't already in hand. We have up to seven days. We don't need to take seven days. If we can do it faster and get it to you, that's up to us. Mm -hmm. well, no, You're now speaking for your, your working group, though. Just want to make clear. Now you have a working group that you're, you're pulling through the knot hole. I... I yeah, if I, we want, we could just do staff. We could just do the staff, the SCAF scoring, since you have the final say for this round. But for the construction grants, we want to do it a little bit of a different way. I think we just change the rules. This is, I think what we're hearing is what we, where we were going, and I, and I know the the timeline complicated it, but is that the four the four of us we're going to make and make 
these decisions and recommendations. I, I thought I thought we just punted on the idea of a subcommittee that was going to review the criteria and the scorecard. We, we did talk to delegating to staff to do that work. Yes. Oh, okay. Optionality oh, wise, okay, if that. you would yeah, like I'm to. I'm talking about the review of the right. application. I mean, it, it, which was your idea? <laughs> yeah, no, I'm. So, I was saying so. So I was saying seven days. If anything's not arriving on the 21st, it can't be addressed on the 28th. If we manage to, and it just leaves it us up to us to score things. That is five days. I, I'm just reminding you, if it arrives on the 21st, it's five days before the before working days. Yeah, we're trying to keep it working. We're trying to do seven. That's what I'm saying. If the score, if are we doing a subcommittee for scoring, or are we just having staff score it this time around? My I'm preference. Not with that. Okay, my preference is staff does the work. If Brian and Holly, you voluntarily want to participate and and dig into the weeds, we want to set you up to do that. But I don't want to hold up the process. You can score it on your own if you would like. We will provide what our score is. You will have the application in full for you to do your own. Oh, yeah. Read it uh, within seven days of a board meeting. Is there sufficient time for the working group to coordinate those elements that you wanted to coordinate? You eloquently spoke about. So the, the only thing I'm thinking of right now is so I'm going to take the scoring thing and give feedback on it regardless. Right, and I'm going to do. I'm going to try to do that in the next two days, right? And I'm going to coordinate with Holly on that so that we give you guys one set of feedback. And if that's a tight time frame, we just got to deal with it. It's better than next week, which in which you know. Yep. Like. So that's that, and then that'll be done. Then, as applications come in to be scored, I think like I want to see those applications, and I will look at the scoring thing myself as I look through them, just to remind me of criteria and, and checkpoints. I know staff is going to score those, and, and that'll be part of the recommendation to the board. And then we'll have a discussion about each one of those applications. And I'll use my notes from my own scoring thing to inform my, my contributions into that discussion. And that's it. And as long yes. as we're receiving those packages five days in advance of the meeting, that should be OK. So, so I think I heard, Rob, do you think it's the right thing to do that as soon as you get one of those applications, just forward it right after the board? Yes. Yeah, because then you have as much yes. time as possible exactly. to be able to look at it and to do your own type of review and to come prepared. Right. Exactly. Could I just ask one favor on each application to Laura's earlier point? Could you just say we received it on this date? And because we received it on this date, here are the subsequent dates we need to meet to be conformed on this application. What we promised. What we promised. Sure. In the RFP. That would be great. Well, sure, I all we've promised so far is a board re it's a staff recommendation within seven days, and then to consider it at the next board meeting. So just put those dates on it. So you're just yeah. going to what's the staff Sunday window, window, and when's the next board meeting where we we need to discuss it? Yes. With a caveat that the, nobody can come in after the 23rd for the 28th. So on Thursday before our meeting, if we have Tuesday meetings set up, we have to have the material in the agenda on the 23rd. And I want to make a hard line on that: 23rd by noon. The, the packet needs to hit us on the 23rd at noon, so we have time to review. Un understood, and uh, we all recognize the challenge was we've been trying to do meetings every week. Understood. Getting materials as when there's so when there's two of us and there's so much else going on that's even that's outside of what is happening here every week. Mm -hmm. <laughs> sure. Madam Chair, uh, just being super cognizant of the time mm -hmm. and noting that Dan and I both ha I have to leave at 12:15. Um, so certainly the board could continue. I think you're so important, right? So about what, do to, what do we need to talk about? I'm just asking you, Madam Chair, to kind of help. I'm looking at the executive session here. items. Do these have to be taken up today? We have two board members who would still have a point. I don't. I don't think we need to take up the. Uh, uh, the, with the one executive session, only that numbers might have changed. Well, we just did the an item that was posted for 1120. So I don't right? think the confidential discussion on civil action needs to be done today. The partnership proposal can be very quick. And we can do that in 10 minutes. Right.
And then what about the results of the design workshop? You want to... no, we don't need to take that up either, because I you I, could talk to Dan about it directly. Right. Exactly. Yeah, in fact, I, I, would, like I would suggest we just we <laughs> Sorry, strike. I'm happy to strike that because I think I would love to talk to Dan beforehand. Right. The proposed decision making timeline that was working well, we backwards. Yeah, we no, kind of have, no, this is the decision making timeline is for the construction grants and what the board needs to decide before we can issue an RFP for the construction grants. We can, we can, can you know. put a proposal together? I'm going to yes. get my type a, on the okay, thank you. 100%. Thank you. I want, so let me be clear. I want staff to give a recommendation yes. and not say, you know, I'm not I'm not criticizing you, Rob. If you ask for feedback, we're going to give it because yeah, that's sorry. what we're. Okay. So don't ask for that. Say this is what we are following. This is staff's recommendation. We are have heartburn on, and we want to pull it off, and we will. But I want you guys to take more of a leadership yep. role in driving the ship because we can't do this by committee and get stuff done. Yep, we got it. Thank you. Do that. Thank you. And I, I'm in That's support true. of you guys. I'm not oh, dissing I, you in any way, shape, or form. I, I, I hear you. Uh, and I, we appreciate that clarity. But I, just, I want to give you the, the keys to the car, and I want you to get in the car and drive. Yep, yeah. we got it. We will. Okay. Tell us where you're going. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> we'll right. give you a list here and there. Take a room and tell you. We can handle the hard knocks if you disagree. My guess. So I always exactly. say disagree quickly. <laughs> exactly. Don't don't you don't need to admit your right. It is eleven thirty. I would like to have ten minutes for Will because we promised to have him um, speak today, and then we will take up the executive session item right. after that. Okay. All right. And yeah. conscious also of noon public comment. Yes, I'm I'm conscious of the time and don't have don't have don't have too many things to discuss, but I do think it's important that the CUDs have some kind of voice during each of these meetings. Um, first, on behalf of all the CDs, I'd like to thank all of you for the great work you're doing. Rob and Christine know that you're, you know, working very hard on all these issues, and uh, you know, although the CUD's top priority is having the full information and full timeline on what each grant will look like and when, uh, we know that it takes time, and really appreciate the work that we're doing. And this past conversation was very was very helpful in that regard, so that we have a much clearer idea of when we'll be getting feedback on these upcoming pre-construction grant applications. Uh, so a couple of quick things. Um, we still have a, a priority, uh, and this was kind of just discussed uh, with regard to the notice. Um, Mikuda would like to have notice on proposals and policies as well. Uh, and I thought that you know the, the five to seven days notice uh, for board members on the packet is something that would be useful for us as well. So we'd continue to stress that uh, we'd like to have some kind of procedure for that so that uh, I, so that we can develop an adequate uh, consensus and response to proposed policies. Um, my thinking in that regard is that for each meeting, I can pr I can prepare a more formal version of this report that I'm doing now. Uh, I can do so in writing. I can do so in presentation. I can do so with both. Uh, and would uh, would like the advice uh, advice of the board on how I can best provide information for you about where the CUDs are at, because uh, I want to know how you'd like to receive this information. Uh, and provide it uh, accordingly. I don't want to be don't want to be talking about something that's you know completely irrelevant. And uh, as long as I know how you'd like to get the message of the CUDs across, that's how I'd like to do it. Uh, so moving on to a couple of specific issues uh, with regard to the RDOF, uh, I'm hearing from a lot of CUDs that they are uh, somewhat confused about how they're going to deal with this patchwork of RDOF sites that are distributed throughout their territory. The number one priority is to build out at 100-100 throughout the entire service area. Uh, and many CUDs would like to do that by building expediently through RDOF territories. So we're very, very interested in the issue of whether our ARPA funding can be used for RDOF uh, and for the construction grants, what that would look like for uh, what kind of requirements for partnerships would be in place and how uh, CUDs will be able to build two sites that have RDOF, RDOF uh, uh, bids already. Uh, because, frankly, these sites are not falling within 100-100 service a lot of the time. The CUDs are looking to build through those. I don't know if that's universal, but I've heard from many CUDs this is a priority uh, to know about. Uh, at our Vicuda meeting on Monday, we authorized, and I know the VCBB staff is very, very busy, but we did authorize VCBB staff to start exploring bulk purchasing for material. Um, and this is something that's is a priority for the CUDs. I know that this may take some time as well. 
Uh, and while we're seeing what kind of offer can be generated uh, through the centralized means, the BCBD, all CUDs are also exploring their own purchasing options right now. So, uh, you know, we're not dead set on a centralized purchasing, but should that be the best avenue, we'd be happy to work with the BCBB uh, to make that arrangement. We've also bandied the idea around of bulk purchasing through Vicuda. However, since Vicuda funding at this point would largely be coming through the BCBB, uh, we've kind of put that idea on the back burner for now since it would be adding a middleman to the process. Um, so, so that's something that uh, we've uh, that we we'd like to continue to work with the VCBB on. Uh, on the issue of affordability, uh, the CUDs very much appreciated Ms. Groshner's presentation last time. All CUDs are completely committed to the issue of affordability. Uh, there's some divergence still on what that looks like in terms of planning and policy for affordability. Uh, but again, we're looking forward to see what kind of uh, what kind of requirements are put forward by the board and working with you on, on those. Uh, also on the Vicuda front, uh, shared services is something that CUDs are starting to express a lot more interest in. Uh, I'm starting to explore, we're starting to explore uh, financial controls. CUDs do want to maintain a large degree of autonomy over their bookkeeping. Uh, however, there is a strong desire expressed for some more professional support to be given, especially in light of audits that may be upcoming. So this is something that uh, within the month, we're going to be proposing to the CUDs to have some kind of uh, united service that can at least support the book having keeping the efforts already in place. Uh, so in the interest of time, uh, I'll conclude there, but if, if anyone has any questions about where the CUDs are at or anything that I can be looking into to help support your mission uh, for the CUDs, please. Uh, Laura. First, I want to, is it okay? Yes, thank, you. Uh, thank you. That was terrific. Uh, and it would be great if we can to receive I would love to receive, um, you know, an update, whatever the CUDs, uh, in addition to what we may ask of them, but whatever the CUDs want us to know um, by CUD um, at every meeting. You know, it, I, I, would, I would, in writing, maybe in advance of the meeting, you know, are there things that you want us to know? Sure. Um, and then with the bulk purchasing um, and any other shared services, I want to make sure that the, between BQDA and... Uh, the VCBB, the, that we have a relationship that is, you know, how can we best serve, you know, if you find that you need, you know, that there's a number of CUDs that are looking for a certain type of service or that, that you are coming to us to see how we might be able first, you know, of course. to... Yeah, yeah, of course. I mean, Vicuda uh, is looking at these shared services uh, and when we do try to acquire them, we'll be going through the board. Uh, so, right. you know, I'm going to try to keep keep you very abreast of what we're doing here since we'll also be applying for funding to make, right. to make this happen. Right. Is that, uh, oh, and uh, with regard to the first part of your comment, I am thinking that if I do have some kind of system to provide a regular report for each meeting, it would be coming in in advance, depending on how much notice I have on, you know, what's going to be considered at the meeting. And it would also have specific remarks from specific CUDs indicating which CUD is taking which view, you know, depending on the circumstances. Of course, I'm always trying to build consensus and present a united front, as I have today. But uh, there may be cases when individual CUDs views have to be voiced, whether for geographic issues or, or financial or what may. So um, one, one piece of information that I, I just remembered is on a call earlier this week with folks in, in Maryland, they are using ARPA funds to supplement RDOC addresses to get them built out sooner. So that leads Say me that to believe. So uh, in, in Maryland, part of the yeah. funding that they're, they're using ARPA funds to give RDOC winners additional funds to make the build out happen faster. That makes me That's believe that right there. that answers the question. Yeah, but we, need to but we want to confirm it. We're going to confirm, we want to confirm where it's it, validated. I wanted to share that to try to reduce any panic. Good enough for me. Whatever you heard, whatever you heard. Subject to change. Yeah. <laughs> I just want to say that that is what I heard, but it needs to be. So actually, no, I, but but I think an important point. So when we ask the question to finance and management that we have the program from Maryland, yep. that they're doing it in hand when yep. we ask okay. the question. So it's That's happening right. in Maryland here. Good advice. Yeah. Yeah, I was, I was yeah, going to ask Maryland a, if they got legal. Yes. We had, we had a conversation with the White House broadband person and a few other states and didn't get this. They weren't, weren't able to speak up. We're going to do it again. But that was one of the states that was on that. And that's where that happened. So yeah. we can look into that. It, so it, we've 
So we do, we definitely need confirmation of this from a legal perspective here in Vermont, but the CUDs are moving ahead with this assumption that RDOF sites are going to be incorporated into the network. It's what's most expedient. Um, sorry, Laura, did you have a comment? Oh, just a thumbs up. Okay, great. Um, that being said, uh, there is a there is a concern, and I know that this is part of the process right now. I'm not going to try to rush it, but there is a concern about how those sites and other sites that are considered served, you know, based on the data that are clearly not, uh, will be incorporated into the the amount of premises that a CUD applies for. So we're very anxious to see how that data data will be incorporated in light of RDOF, in light of uh, locations that may be considered served that the CUDs, you know, know to be otherwise. Um, so incorporated how? Let's go back to our incorpor into the uh, premises uh, in the application for construction. I, I think this goes this goes to the actual formula how we're going to distribute uh, construction funds. Yes. And I would certainly welcome Bakuda coming to us with an idea that, exactly. that they suggest. Right. Yeah. So we have to figure it out in terms of other and actually I put that out there to the world of other eligible providers. How do you suggest it? Give us feedback. Yeah, and, and we will be coming with this because many many CUDs are concerned uh, that the number of premises they'll be able to apply for successfully is much lower than what they'll actually have to serve. Uh, so this will be going into that conversation, and I just want to make it clear that it is a top priority. For the this does, though, go to our baseline data discussion. Exactly. And is you know critical. And so while we've already booked our meeting for the 28th, and it's busy. With, um, I would hope that we would set aside a meeting to get this done, this baseline discussion. Yeah, and we, we want CUD input into that baseline discussion because we can't waste cycle time arguing over data. Yeah. We will we will to some degree, but it can't be the most wasted cycle. So we really want your input up front so that we can try to land something that everyone is willing to accept. Yeah, that, that, that's great. And um, I, I can uh, try to put together a report uh, for CD perspective specifically on this issue. Uh, I don't know, you know how conducive it'll be. Uh, hopefully very. Uh, but I can uh, I can talk to all the CDs about data issues specifically and see where we stand mm -hmm. and what we want these baselines to be. And I'd, also, I'd also like their input in what role do they want to play as the kind of verifiers on the ground in their territory when there are gaps identified between the baseline data and what people are observing on the ground? Because there's going to be that. That is a big question. Yeah, and do they want to, I would love for them to play the role of being like, we can reconcile gaps in the data because we know we know the reality on the ground and we can bring that back to whatever the baseline data is telling us. And it's not going to change the baseline. It's just going to be a reported variable. Yeah. It's a bit, yeah. It's a bit of a, it's a bit of a separate issue in, down the road. But I can incorporate that into my conversations. Just looking as well. ahead. Looking so, ahead. So for our group and for Will's benefit, our meeting after the 28th is October, what? Fourth. So. And it's anticipated that this meeting will. Oh, sorry. Is that the only Monday? We're doing? I think we switched the Mondays. Has that been sent we out? We switched the Mondays every right? other week. The, 20, the 28th has not been sent out. I will get that sent out since it was originally. And I don't have the 4th either. Is that sent out yet? That was sent out. Yeah. So starting on the 4th, are we Monday afternoons every other week going forward? Yes. Yeah, that was great. Yeah. But one, one other thing that came up earlier in the meeting is just hearing how HUDs are coordinating or not coordinating or attempting to coordinate with RDOF partners. Yes. Uh, oh, right. I meant to address this. This is something that I don't have the full picture on yet. Um, it's something I'm going to be have to talk to the CUDs about uh, because I'm not going to represent them when I don't know. No. So, uh, I I know that uh, CUDs are evaluating where the RDOF uh, partners are. I don't know exactly where each of them are at in terms of actually, you know, making conversation with them and figuring out what's going to happen. So I will I will evaluate that and see what I can report back to the board. Um, in the interest of time, are there any other uh, questions? Or just or last comment, we'll just going forward, having your presence here is going to be great and helpful. I, it would be really helpful to me when you're giving us information, if you can be very specific about when you are speaking on behalf of all the CUDs and you have consensus yes. right. versus when you are speaking on behalf of some CUDs or some feedback that is not necessarily consensus based. 
just making that distinction will help everything. Yes. Uh, and, and I do note that you did try to do that today. Yeah, by saying, you know, I'm, I'm consistently trying to do that. And, you know, hopefully as the CUDs, you know, learn more about what I'm doing here and uh, I'll be able to get more consistent feedback. Uh, but also I'll continue to, when I'm making reports, I may be able to even say which CUDs are, are voicing which views with permission. Um, so I'll continue to try and work on that and uh, improve that relationship. That'd be great. Thank you. Thank Some you. things can be unique. Some things cannot. Like we, there's going to be how we count. It's going to be, you know, so to the extent that they can come forward with you know, some consensus thinking. Good. All right. Any other comments, questions? Thank you very much. Thank you very much for, for giving me the time. All right. I'd like to take the time to move to executive session. We'll take up the one item in executive session. We have a motion to go into executive session. So moved. Second. Second. All those in favor, aye. Aye. Any opposed? Somebody I need to take off into the room, and we will for everybody online. We will be stopping the we will be stopping the video and the audio at this time. Uh, we wait outside. We can come and get you. Right. Yeah. Well, I think I may just come back on virtually for public comments. Okay. Okay. Well, public comment is at noon. At noon. At noon correct. Sharp. So we will be back on. Well, we don't use for executive session. Maybe we use for a very brief break. Yes. So we'll be back on at noon. So we're just turning off the video and audio now. On video. Okay. We are out of executive session at 12.02. No action was taken in executive session. We will now turn it over to public comment. Anybody? There's no one left in the room here. Is there anybody online that would like to speak? We're keeping it to three minutes, and then if the board has additional questions. Uh, FX has a question. Unmute yourself, FX. Okay. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Uh, good work this morning. I just thought I would um, comment quickly on the, uh, on the issue of the mapping and all that. Uh, would it be okay if I uh, if I shared something? Sure. Uh, sure. I think you have the ability. If you don't, I yeah. See uh, if you have the ability first, and then I might have to change your status. But I... yeah, see if you have it first. If it doesn't work, let me know, and I'll press a button to see if it works. <laughs> I'm pausing this three minutes, so I'll leave for the technical. Okay. Yes. Yeah, I'm not. Oh, wait a second. Yep. Here it is. Okay, terrific. Um, great. Okay, that should be coming up. Come on. Seeing a spreadsheet. You're seeing a spreadsheet trends video. Okay, no. good. Okay, excellent. Um, so uh, this this all is uh, some work that I did uh, in support of the uh, equal access to broadband work. Um, I basically took layers from um, the uh, state map. Uh, I, I created a layer where I more carefully defined what I thought the cable services area areas were. Uh, and uh, I took also the layer for the uh, phone companies because I needed to know by each um, site address uh, what the state thought the service level was, who the CUD was, uh, what the status would be if they were in EC fiber territory, who the phone company would be, who the cable company would be, and whether or not there was a fiber company. Um, and some of the things that I can do with this now is I can see in terms of the uh, lit customers in EC fiber towns, how many the state thinks get 10-1, how many the state thinks get 100-100, how many get 25-3. I can also look at uh, situations where uh, we're, we've over, overbuilt charter in a few places, uh, and I can split that out 
and see these things. So this is all very easy to do uh, with the availability of the state data. And I think that um, uh, let's see. Twenty seconds, FX. Yeah, I'm done. You're just letting us know. Do you have a concluding point? Yeah, FX. Okay. It's, it, so this is exact. This is exactly what we're envisioning as a board to help us drive decision making. So this is great. I'm psyched that you guys have this data. Any chance we could get you to do this on behalf of the whole state? <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Is he frozen or just really quiet? I'm not sure. Are you there? I'm not sure. I'm not sure what happened there or how much of what I said you heard. I just we, was basically. We volunteered to you to do this for the entire state. Pardon me. <laughs> we volunteered for you to do this for the entire state. I've already done it. You have beyond the AC fiber territory. Yes. 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 Oh, so that. the GS GIS administrator we hire would do something similar to this. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Are you willing, are you willing to this? share this table, FX? I don't know. I'd have, to talk, I'd, I'd have to talk to the chairman of the Board of Equal Access to Broadband. I think she would consider it. She's very reasonable. <laughs> yeah, but I can go I can go through how I did this with, you know, whoever you hire for the GIS. It's pretty straightforward. The one thing that I had to do was make my own layer for the uh, cable companies because um, the, uh, the, you know, the information didn't exactly match up with my perception of what those boundaries were, and I wanted to be a little more careful about it. Okay, fact, thank you. Could you add in the, the electric distribution utility for each of those? Because some of those have make-ready tariffs that by its location can help add further funding to these build projects. Oh, yeah, yeah, because uh, we've got those territories as well. That would just be another layer, and then you would do the join and have another column. That would be perfect. All right, so if we have more time, we can come back to you, FX, but I want to get, be considerate of everybody in the public comment section. Thank you very yeah, much. That's fine. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah. Got a few pivot tables. Okay, Bam, any other go. questions? <laughs> Well, not questions, comments or questions. Public Why comment. Not? Anybody else want to speak? I don't see any other hands. You're doing such a good job that everybody should not ride in the way. <laughs> More exhausted. <laughs> okay. No other no other comments. We have a few more minutes. You want to go back to FX? Does anybody else have questions? Is there anything else on our agenda we need to do? Well, yes, for sure. Like, what about the design workshop comments, oh, or are you going to gonna take that offline? Yeah. And when are we going to address this proposed decision-making timeline? Is that going to be? It's the staff is going to develop a more detailed proposal that for, yes. for, for the construction side. For the construction side, yes. that will assign October. assign topics for different okay. board meetings that where we need decisions to be made. Yeah, for she's saying when are we going to get it? For, for the October, October 4th. I would say the October 4th meeting at, yeah. the, at the latest. If I get it done sooner, I will send it out as soon as I will send it out as soon as I can. You're getting, That's 48 you're getting, hours you're getting agenda cramp is my point. So we need to have our baseline discussion on October 4th. We probably need our second slide at the, at the construction criteria. And there'll be grant applications. And there'll be grant applications flowing through. Okay. A lot happening. Just, but I'm trying to get you. I'm trying to be. <laughs> yeah. To encourage calibration. <laughs> it's it's challenging when there there's a tight time frame for everything. If uh, with uh, the timeline that was in the previous packets, set a goal of trying to have the RFP out for construction in early December, uh, so that we're on track for construction next year. Yeah, we have to meet that. So, so we have that's to the. So that's why I want to prioritize that. Okay. My priorities are basically the, the grant applications and then figuring out figuring out with you all what needs to be a board decision versus versus what can be delegated to staff. You, is there any jeopardy on the December timeline? It really depends on how 
how deep of a dive we want to take in. I encourage everybody to look at Act 71 and specific things that you want to address as a board that we need to have policies rather than ask questions, mm -hmm. I think is the key. Because we could structure it that we ask the applicants to address A, B, C, and D is one way to do it, and we evaluate their answers at that time. It's In the last five meetings, we have made, I'm just going to call them policy statements. We have made policy statements. And I attempted to gather those up, mm -hmm. but we we need to go back and revisit those. So you can either look at the minutes, you can take the task guideline challenge that the board put out, or we can set aside a meeting after we go through the baseline discussion to do a policy or guideline review. I think and that would happen by mid-October, still in plenty of time for the dis development of the RFP. Right, because the guidelines should show up heavily in the RFP. Mm -hmm. just, just, to get, just to give a preview, as I briefly went through this last night, like we have to define how funding is going to be allocated. That's why I tossed it back to Bakuda to give us, a, give us a proposal, give us a starting point to work with. We have to define industry accepted engineering standards. Is it a standard or do we pose that question? Is it a single standard? These are just things we just need to get more certainty for applicants. Defining incidental over building. I know we did address that. Uh, but we so need to make sure that we have it nailed. Yeah. yeah, we have to make sure we have and to. And the affordability question and how it comes to bear on the business plan and the project design. Is exactly. Important. Exactly. And there's like include public broadband assets that can be shared by multiple service providers that can support a variety of purposes. These are all priorities, not enumerated. And what is resilience lever look like? Defining resiliency, defining redundancy. So these are these are things where we, yeah. And then there's the whole question of how the other providers that are other eligible entities applying, like this isn't just only for CUDs. No, how companies. do they play ball? How do we evaluate whether it conflicts with the business plan of a CUD? How do we evaluate it if it's not in a CUD territory? There's there's quite a, a lot of items that I think any and all applicants would would like some direction on, <laughs> and I, as a staff person, would like some direction on. Well, why don't you make a list? Ro yeah. Rob, this is Roger Nishi, and uh, you just hit on, maybe it's because you saw my face, you just hit on my um, questions and comments as how you're going to treat other eligible pro providers, which also includes small communications carriers, which are the, the RLEX, and also internet service providers working in conjunction with a CUD. So, um, we're interested in in the steps there and, and what you're going to expect from us and, and how we get incorporated into the whole process. Thank you. Krista has her hand up. Oh, Krista. Krista. Krista Hi, ahead. thanks. Um, I just uh, wanted to synthesize and, and pose uh, the question again. I, I think that Holly's point is important in the sense that there are a lot of things that are discussed and it would be helpful for the board to be able to synthesize those so that they don't sort of have to be revisited and rediscussed and there's a lot going on so those people have a lot in their heads and there's time between meetings etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, at the same time just uh, reiterating our desire to have a, a process that's that's clear and identifying you know what what the what the proposal is providing room for feedback, getting that feedback, and then um, deciding on it. So I think to the degree, I think what I'm hearing um, is that you're looking at trying to find a process to identify how to do that. And um, we certainly support that process and the ability to provide input. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. All right, any other public comments? Hearing none, I will uh, uh, I want to say it was scheduled and then we remove yeah. the meeting, so I'd have to see. Yeah, so it was talking it was about next meeting now. One o'clock. Here. September 28th at 1. I have Giga as a question mark. I will find out right now if Giga is available. Well, we can, we can we'll, also do we'll that. We'll find out. Yeah. yeah. Oh, there's good news. I can make that. <laughs> Yay!
All right, I'll take a motion to adjourn. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Meeting adjourned. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you very Thank you. much. <laughs> 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 there